Are you ready for a night like no other? No other. Turn down the lights, turn up the radio, and stand by for a night out special with Alan Robson. struck you in the back. You're choking, you're choking. <coughs> and what's happening now? Me, they've got me. They've got you. What's happening now? Oh. What's happening? Oh, a sword. A sword as well. <coughs> so imagine following footsteps long past and taking that man to find out his story and the story of William Wallace. I would love it if you came too. Together, we'll walk in the footsteps of the brave heart. I fear we have no time. Our hearts entwined, our lives resigned to Desperate measures of despair I need to steal away To where the grey cannot take hold But return us to the tranquil dreams of
this is Alan Robson on the Night Owls programme. If you can hear a little bit of background noise, it's because I'm not just travelling, I'm travelling back in time. And the strange thing is I'm not just travelling back to another time. I'm taking someone with me who has experienced that previous time. A few months back, I regressed a man called Kenny. He went back to early Scotland, where he fought battles, where as a child he was responsible for following armies into battle to finish off any of the English enemy. Now this is a man who up until that time had only visited Scotland on a couple of occasions. He knew nothing about Scottish history. And then you discover that he was fighting in an army led by William Wallace. Who was Wallace? What was it about him? If you think about all of the great heroes of history, they're all remembered essentially because they were victorious, because they were winners. And although Wallace had his victories, essentially he was defeated and killed in the most horrendous and harrowing way, which is where our story doesn't end. Because Kenny's with me now. We're driving through Scotland. It's a dark night. And we're going to find out the truth. How would it feel for somebody who can remember so vividly what it's like to fight on a battlefield? You're also going to hear that regression where Kenny dies in agony, feeling the tips of swords penetrating his body, axes slamming into his back, and he's screaming in terror. You're going to hear all of that tonight. And you're also going to hear the other story. Because tonight, live, we're walking in the footsteps of Braveheart. places that William Wallace the Braveheart made famous and if you open the window when you're traveling at this pace a strange thing happens and I don't know but there's just something different about Scottish air there's something different about Scottish light now I must admit the light is disappearing there's a haze in the sky but darkness is climbing across this whole country. We've been travelling for coming up to a couple of hours now. We're not far away from the places we need to be, but I just thought it would be quite interesting if I had a chat with Kenny, because following his regression 
Kenny started checking his various family history. Now, in the regression, he was a McGregor. He was a member of the McGregor clan. And we suddenly discover that his surname, Dick, when you look back throughout history, Dick is one of the McGregor clan names. And it keeps getting stranger. We've checked historically the times and the dates of the various things that happened in Kenny's regression and they all fit. They all align themselves around the time that William Wallace was coming to Providence. As I say, Kenny is driving me up to Scotland as we speak to allow me to have the chance to talk to you. Kenny, it's been quite a while since we actually did that regression and the most vivid thing that I remember is me coming back in the room with a glass of water for you because you were physically shaking and you had your shirt up and you were checking to see whether you'd actually been left any marks when they finished you off. When you think back about that regression, and I know afterwards quite often the story fleshes itself out in your head that you can remember a little bit more, it was a bit of a turning point for you, wasn't it? It was a massive turning point. Like I said, when you come back in there, I pulled my top up to have a look if there was a hole in my stomach. It was that vivid and that real. And did you feel the pain as, as fiercely as that? The pain was really that bad. It was agony and an axe in me back and then the sword through my stomach and I could feel all that and that's obviously when I come out of it, which I had to because I was choking and obviously dying. Yeah. Very scary. And yet, since then, you've been up to Scotland, but you've never actually been to the places that we're going to be taking you to tonight. How does it feel to maybe be returning to the place where you died? It's Not many people you can say that no, to. No, you can't, can you? Um, it's quite exciting, but also there's a bit of a fear there as well because I just do not know what to expect, how I'm going to feel when I get there. Really looking forward to it, but also, as I say, there's, there's that fear there because I'm, I, I don't know how it's going to feel for me. Right. Well, we're going to find that out. We're also going to be telling you an awful lot of stuff that, truthfully, people who know the Wallace story, know it usually because of Mel Gibson in the film Braveheart. And you take that as, well, it was in the film, so it must have been true. To be quite honest, there was an awful lot in that movie that just quite simply wasn't true. His romance with the Queen and all that, it was kind of added to and twisted. You're going to find out the real truth about who William Wallace was and why people from Kenny to the ordinary common man of Scotland why they rallied to his side and were prepared to put their lives on the line for him. Because he was one of those people that was destined to die. And there's a lot of people who seem to have found themselves in that situation, and they're usually icons. If you think about it, John Lennon may well have been born to die because the message and the legacy that Lennon left behind wouldn't have been the same if he was still alive today as a 60-year-old musician who could no longer get a song in the charts. Maybe James Dean, who died when his Porsche Spider crashed on that bend on the outskirts of Los Angeles. His light was put out when he was in his early 20s. He'd only made three films and he was considered the great rebel. Even now, people look back and say, wasn't he a great actor? He actually wasn't that great an actor. But he's remembered with such fondness because maybe he was born to die. Marilyn Monroe, John F. Kennedy, there's quite a few, and Princess Diana even. Perhaps their legends, perhaps their shadow wouldn't be so great unless their life had been snatched away in the way that they were. So what was it about Wallace? Who was he? Was he a good lad? Did we follow him because he was one of us? And the weird thing is, I'm from Newcastle, I'm a Novo Castrian. Technically, the Novo Castrians were loyal to the kings. We were loyal to the English in Newcastle, but I'm living in Northumberland. And I must admit, I much prefer the Northumbrian philosophy on all of this. And essentially, right the way through that time, the vast majority of people had nothing to fear from the Scots because they didn't have anything. It was only the people in the castles, the poshies, that had to worry about the Scots because the Scots were going to come and try and take their stuff. My family, or my ancestors, would have no stuff at all. We'd be picking berries and trying to get by on what we could. Robsons were a traditionally border reaver, so we were probably robbing the same people that the Scots were robbing. And 
it's an interesting part of the world because I always think that the Northeast has far more in common with the Scots than it has with the Southern Jessies, with the people down south, the seat of government, London, the home counties. We have nothing in common with those people at all, pretty much. We don't even have the same language. And certainly our way of life and the way we conduct ourselves is completely different. We will fight because somebody tells us that the enemy, for example, during World War II, we were more likely to go and fight against the Germans because somebody would have said, he's a right B, that Hitler. Right, we'll be having him then. You know, forget the fact that he invaded Poland. If we believe that somebody's done something wrong, we want to put it right. And that's the root of William Wallace. That's where he starts. We're going to take you right the way through right to the time that William Wallace came to Newcastle. And I'm just wondering how many people who even live in the city of Newcastle or surrounds would even know that he was there. We're going to tell you chapter and verse. Tonight, live, we're walking in the footsteps of the Braveheart. And you are in for a night like you have never known before. We're also going to be going back in history because tonight we've got an eyewitness. We have that regression from somebody who was there before, fought in the battle that was Wallace's greatest victory, and he ended up dying because of the loyalty he gave to the Braveheart. This is going to be a night like no other. Alan Robson. Travelling to Scotland. Let's have some more of that Scottish air. Radio. Alan Robson, walking in the footsteps of the Braveheart. You didn't get dressed up for nothing. Robson on our way to walk in the footsteps of Braveheart. Now, we've all watched a swashbuckling Mel Gibson in the role of William Wallace in that movie. But I want to give you an idea of who he was. And the search begins at the National Wallace Monument at the very top of Abbey Craig near Stirling. We're heading in that direction now. And at that monument... A simple glass case displays the most treasured icon to an entire Scottish nation's favourite hero. It's the Wallace Sword. Now, no one's quite sure how it's remained intact, as most Scottish swords from that time were of notoriously poor construction. During pitched battles, fighters would have to put their swords on the ground and try to stamp on them to straighten them. During brutal exchanges, they were known to break buckle, snap. Instead, they designed sword handles as huge metal grips so they could bludgeon their enemy when the sword failed somehow. Because the sword would fail. It's generally believed that the sword was taken as a trophy by Sir John Monteith after he betrayed Wallace. Later, King James the Fourth repaired the grip and made it look far more embellished than Wallace had. It's a two-handed sword. It's that massive thing that you see used usually to advertise the film. And it was made 
to perhaps make people think that William Wallace would need to be about seven feet tall to be able to wield a sword that size. And yet the sword was used in the same way to the way that a hammer thrower throws the hammer. You swing yourself around, your body gets a momentum, and you're literally a whirling dervish just cutting through everybody around you. You whirl it around your head, your hips and shoulders twisting as if you had a hula hoop. Yet it was strength and not height that was important. So the lower your center of gravity, the better. If you were a tall man, this type of weapon could easily cost you your life. With this above your head, the whole of your torso would be open for a spear point or an arrow. And that mighty sword that had taken the lives of countless Englishmen and numerous Scots loyal to assassin that king never had a scabbard. If it had, it would have taken a man of 15 feet to be able to draw it out of the scabbard. Now there's a local historian here in Scotland called Archie Craggs and he said William Wallace is Scotland's ultimate hero. When those Scots with the power were too frightened to act against impossible odds, a common man stepped forward to shame them all. The myth is as important as what Wallace actually achieved because it helped form the personality of the modern day Scot. Fiercely independent, loyal to friends and family, but an enemy you'd rather not make. Over the centuries, a lot of famous writers would use the Wallace in their texts. The North's most famous poet, William Wordsworth, who we know as the Lakeland poet from the Lake District, he wrote, Or oh, I would record how Wallace fought for Scotland and left the name of Wallace to be found like a wild flower all over his dear country. Left the deeds of Wallace like a family of ghosts to people. The steep rocks and river banks, her natural sanctuaries, were the local soul of independence and stern liberty. It's what the Scots are about. It's why we love the Scots as much as we do. Famous Scottish poet Robbie Burns visited one of Wallace's known safe havens, a place called Leglin Wood, on the Ochen Kruv estate in Ayrshire. He was inspired by just what he felt there. You talk about how Wallace's ghost, how Wallace's spirit is in all of the places where he stood, and people drink it in. They soak it up like a sponge, and... Robbie Burns would later write As I explored every den and dell where I could suppose my heroic countrymen to have sheltered I recollect for even then I was a rhymer that my heart glowed with a wish to be able to make a song on him equal to his merits Now one of Wallace's most famous biographers was a scribe called Blind Harry who actually wasn't blind, who followed Wallace's exploits and he wrote them in a really vivid way. Most writers of the day cleaned up battle descriptions so that they would be palatable for polite society. Blind Harry, well, frankly, told it like it was. Bloody, gory, often biased, often unfair and always truly horrific. And if you think about it, fighting on a field with a thousand people hacking, gouging, mutilating. This certainly would not be a pretty way of life. But let's look at the man, this ordinary man, who lit the blue touch paper to a, a glorious Scottish rebellion that helped the Scots become who they are today. An ordinary man, just like you, an ordinary, decent person who was responsible for extraordinary things. Yet at first, he was considered little more than an outlaw. With most of Scotland completely under the heel of the English boot, young Wallace found it hard to swallow that foreign troops had stolen his nation. He was the son of a noble knight, Malcolm Wallace, who was a good man, 
with little or no money, merely a family lane stretching back to Wales many centuries before. It's believed that the name Wallace was originally Waleses, <laughs> meaning men who had settled in Scotland yet were originally from Wales. So the Waleses became Wallace. And one day, young William Wallace was walking through Lanark, which is where he was raised, when he noticed that there was an altercation between an Englishman and a market stall holder. Now, the Englishman was beating him with a small horsewhip. The man's crime was being overheard criticising the English king for overtaxing them. Frankly, if everybody who bleated on about being overtaxed was to be horsewhipped, we'd all have stripes like zebras at a match. The old man was unconscious, and yet even still the Englishman was kicking into his head and stamping on his chest. Now at that time, Wallace had no idea who he was, only that this Englishman was huge in frame and the stall holder tiny in comparison. He yelled to the Englishman to stop, only to be met with a vitriolic recant. As Wallace approached him, he noticed the man was huge and armed to the teeth. In fact, this man was actually the Sheriff of Lanark. And this was a title that had been given to him by the King of England. He was a great warrior. He'd fought in many a battle. He was very powerful. And everybody in Lanark knew not to cross him. His friends were in very high places indeed. Wallace saw only unfairness. So he felt he had to act. And how much of a northern trait is that? We've got to stick our nose into any business that we feel is unfair. The sheriff was much bigger than young Wallace. Yet when the Englishman flicked the whip towards him, he never flinched as the whip took flesh off his cheek. Instead, he slammed a punch into the Englishman's gut with such force... He doubled over and collapsed onto the floor. Wallace helped the old man as the Englishman got to his feet and drew his sword. Now this man had been involved in many battles and skirmishes and he held the power in Lanark almost single-handed. Wallace drew a small dirk, a knife and leapt at him. Swords were of no use at all in close combat, and they writhed around on the cobbled street until finally Wallace was on top of this man's mountainous chest. The dirk was brought down into the sheriff's eye as an audible gasp went around the crowd. Wallace pulled it out, only to slam it back in again, full force, and again, and again, and again, and finally he twisted it scrambling his brain. Now the Scots had been downtrodden for what seemed like an eternity. So the sight of a fellow Scot daring to challenge English authority, that in itself was incredible. And it led to Blind Harry writing, Our old enemies come of Saxon blood that never yet to Scotland would do good. Within the next few weeks, his fellow Scots sought to join up with Wallace, and within three months, he had a small army prepared to follow him anywhere. They also knew that to be with him meant certain death. If any of them had been captured by the English, who had already named him their most wanted outlaw. Now, isn't this just typical English class society? A lot of Scots had killed English soldiers. A lot of Scots had killed ordinary English people. Yet the most wanted person in all of Scotland was Wallace. Because he killed one of the elite, one of the upper class society. Because let's face it, as the upper class society likes to believe, well, they're more important than we are. Wallace knew better. Robbie Burns later penned it right. Scots who with Wallace bled, Scots who Bruce had often led, welcome to your gory bed, or to victory. Lay the proud usurper's law, tyrants fall in every four, liberty is in every blow, let us do or die. And I think that's how the Scots feel, even now, fiercely independent, strong. 
not going to take any crap. And I love them for that. And it was around this time that history began to know who Wallace was. This is the time when Wallace raised his head. As a child, apparently, he'd watched women raped by English troops. Houses and homesteads looted, burned, neighbours butchered, churches sacked and desecrated, and he burned with hatred. His best friend, Robert Mackay, was once in the woods climbing an apple tree when an apple from that tree fell, hitting an English soldier on the head. The boy refused to come down, frightened as to what the soldier would do. So they cut the tree down and the ten-year-old was hanged. Young Wallace had found his friend's body and carried it home to his parents. Now, Wallace had fought back for the very first time and it felt good. Wallace would seek to feel that good all the time. Most listened to Alan Robson's Night Owls. Bring me one of them. Alive and possible. Dead. Just good. I must say one of the great things about doing a special on somebody like this is it brings a lot of night owls into play that are normally perhaps feeling quite a long way away. We've got a lot of listeners in central Scotland and Uncle Arthur is probably one of our most famous. He lives in Carstairs and he sent me an email about our potential journey and this was months ago when we were just kind of in the planning stages of it he says I'm keen to hear that you're doing a Wooly Wallace special for your show if that's the case you might be interested to know that something very odd has been going on in Lanark brackets five miles from me brackets the home of Mr. Braveheart himself it was of course the place for the recent Wallace celebrations where Lanark's very own clan Wallace laid him to rest in the graveyard of St. Kentigan's Church 700 years on I must admit they've only got a quarter of them in there but they've got at least it's a bit they laid him to rest beside his wife Marion Braidfoot who was slaughtered by the Sheriff of Lanark and is also resting in the church and I must admit there's probably as little of her as there is of him Well, a new retail park has been built directly across the road from the old church graveyard and already some supernatural experts have had to investigate some ghostly incidents in some of the shops and car parks there. They have the theory that it might possibly be the ghost of Marion 
because she died in such a barbaric way. Then again, Alan, Lanark is a real hotbed of ghosts, including the Green Lady who has a street named after her. She's seen around the orphanage, plus several other ghosts at New Lanark and at Cartland Bridge. Uncle Arthur giving us a tip to perhaps another ghost hunt in months and years to come. We've got plenty of places to see, and we're moving. The present moment, we're hitting one of those roads that have got the little cones down the centre, so everybody's travelling at about 15 miles an hour. But we're going to get there. We're on our way, walking in the footsteps of William Wallace, the brave heart. with you walking in the footsteps of the brave heart tonight we're still making our way to where we need to be where we're going to soak in the wonders of what wallace is about we're just overtaking some mazda truck that's heading down to some unpronounceable scottish place overtaking a little fiesta kind of thing and slamming my foot down again Kenny's with me now. You've obviously seen the William Wallace film. Did you know any? Because the weird thing is, in a previous life, we discovered you actually fought, if not with him, certainly in the armies that he had under his control. What was your view on Wallace? I mean, prior to the regression, did you know anything about him? I knew absolutely nothing about him at all. Didn't have a clue, even in history. I'd never even heard his name, never done any research on it, anything like that, and then obviously after the regression, I wanted to watch the film, seen the film, and then it just brought it all to life for me. Because essentially, although the film has been added to and they've put facets in there that aren't true, people would have dressed like that, people would, and you, the, the weird thing is in the regression, I remember you describing vividly how what people wore on their feet, and sometimes it wasn't shoes, they would just essentially cover them with cloth and then tie them. And that's what you were wearing when you were a child going around battlefields finishing off people. That was one of the first things I seen in that regression um, because I looked down at my feet and I had rags on my feet and I thought, what the hell is that? And then when you look up, it was a sort of a, a garment that you were wearing that was tied together with a metal brooch type of thing. Right. And I suppose that was the first indication that it was something to do with Scotland. Right, mm. right. All very weird. And yet... Again, as you go through your previous life, it was just the natural thing to do was to kill and take people's lives. It seemed like that, yeah. That What I had to do was, as we said last night, was to finish people off. And, you know, I think the rest of the soldiers had done their work on them. And when they were still alive, I went around mopping up type of thing, just making sure they were dead. And then taking what riches I could from them, jewellery, swords and weapons. Right. It's the one thing that you don't particularly think about is you picture the battle, but the aftermath of the battle essentially was you going round. If you found a Scot, you'd try and help them if they were still alive. If they were English, yeah. you'd kind of finish them off. So we're travelling up towards the places where William Wallace did all of his tales of daring do and he was an amazing person you know we're talking about how the wallace raised his head the first time he was noticed killing the sheriff who was mistreating an innocent man and you describe william wallace as a scottish knight and when you have an image of knights of old in your head you think of a man with armor knights of the round table which was another fiction i hasten to add because i must say i really fancy next doing walking in the footsteps of arthur king of the britons because he was on hadrian's wall he wasn't down south and people say tintagel's where camelot was how could it have been he was fighting in the north fighting against the picts and the scots quite often but to describe yourself as a knight sounds very grand in Scotland, 
Most people were loosely connected with some lord or laird of a clan, yet young William may well have been, as we know, from Welsh stock. Many Celts from the Welsh marshes had been driven out by the English and had sought refuge in the masses of uninhabited land here in Scotland, where we are now. Even today, at a time when you often hear people talking of overcrowding on the British Isles, the majority of the Scottish nation lives in four cities, with huge swathes of land practically free of people. Yet as young William was growing up, he'd seen so much injustice, and a lot of it on his own doorstep. One incident that we know of, he witnessed involved a foul-mouthed drunk called Robertson who had been town bully for most of his life. Everybody was frightened of him. After in full view of town, he caught a man who'd been trying to steal his horse. While he held the culprit's head under his arm, he took his dirk, a small knife held in his stocking, and he proceeded to cut off the man's head using this tiny, tiny dirk. Rather like any good butcher, he moved the small blade back and forth to remove the soft tissue first before using it to displace the head, prizing it off the spinal column. It took far less time than you would imagine and Robertson's lap was awash with blood as the man's body detached, sliding to the floor. He held up the thief's head and he held it high as a warning to anybody else who would even think of doing such a thing. This was known as Robertson's execution. And Wallace mentioned it to a number of his teenage friends. He'd commented that in a single stroke, Robertson had gained a national reputation with one single barbaric act. Barbarism was regularly used to set examples and the most barbaric always carried out by those who had the most power. He had also asked a man who'd been hanged yet didn't die what it had felt like. The man was called Mackay and he'd been arrested by the English for trespassing on their property. I think you probably would have found it was Scotland. However, it was his field that they had appropriated to build their camp and he'd returned to his home for some of his things. So the English decided to hang him. Now what does it feel like? Everybody's seen on television, usually cowboy films where they're hanging some rustler. And you think, I wonder what it would feel like to actually have a rope around your neck and suddenly the cart to be driven away from under your feet. Mackay said, at first I felt the heat of rope as it gripped my throat. Then I couldn't breathe, my chest tight, and the pressure in my head made it feel like it would bust. Then it went black. Whilst unconscious, his shallow breathing had saved his life, and his friends cut him down to bury him, only to discover he was alive. He eventually made a full recovery. The only mark of his misadventure was a scorched and scarred neck, testament to his incredible good fortune. And we're talking about a time when justice did not exist. The English made claim to Scotland. No Scot could claim to have anything. None of the clan chiefs were standing against them. And Wallace had even asked his father why his dad hadn't led a rebellion to sweep the English from their lands. William Wallace's time was coming. Alan Robson walking in the footsteps of the bereaved heart. I was wondering if you could do that when it matters. As it, as it matters in battle. Could you crush a man with that throw? I could crush you like a worm.
But to be quite honest, I hoped we would be there now. <laughs> We've been doing that kind of thing during ad breaks and little bits of music. We'd be going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And we're not... <laughs> no. It's a uh, Yeah. Beautiful, Heather. On either side of the road, in fairness, and I don't know whether it's just this time of night when the sun's going down, the purple of the Heather just seems to still stand out, and it makes the landscape look just different to as it is at home. The verges along the side of the road that we're on, and we're actually on a single carriageway at the moment, behind some kind of yellow... What kind of car is that? Just it's a Seat. It's a Seat, is it? Or behind some kind of bright yellow Seat. And we should actually try and overtake it sometime to, to find out who would actually drive a yellow, <laughs> a yellow Sian. And we go down either side of the road, Heather, just growing everywhere. Symbol of a nation, symbol of good luck. Wasn't actually too lucky for William Wallace eventually. And yet he's just left a shadow behind him that no man can live up to. But blame me. A lot of Scots try. And he's remembered by everybody. And it's the strangest thing. You know, because if you talk about great heroes, there's usually a bit of melancholy attached to them as well. Nelson, he wins at the Battle of Trafalgar. He's lost an arm. He's eye, one eye's whack. And uh, doesn't matter. He even dies before the battle's won because, in fairness, everybody knows it was the North East Lord Collingwood who actually led that battle and defeated the French. It was Nelson who just essentially got killed before the fracas kind of kicked off. But he's the hero, and you think, name great English heroes, and you come up with people like Nelson. Even some people say Boudicca, you know, Boudicca. She ended up poisoning herself rather than being captured by the Romans. Blame me, we're going to have to walk in her footsteps too at some time. So There's a lot of footsteps we're going to be walking in by the time we're finished. And yet, we're travelling through Scotland and there's some sheep to the left of me scattered across. Okay, not, not really a huge hill, small river running by on my left-hand side, dropping away. Farmer who's obviously got his crops pretty much ready to harvest. I don't even know what that is. It looks like kale or something similar. As we're moving again across to the other side of Scotland. Now, for those of you that live in Durham or Sunderland or Middlesbrough, Darlington, Washington, Gateshead, Newcastle, every Northumbrian knows that you can get to Scotland really easily. You can get up to Edinburgh in no time at all. It's a fabulous city to visit. Some of the best shopping in the world, Glasgow, that's tomorrow morning if everything goes according to plan, Ken. <laughs> and we uh, are moving across there, and just a lot of people tend not to push a journey too far. If you get a chance, come up to Glasgow, come up and see the things that we're going to be showing you on our journey in the footsteps of William Wallace the Braveheart. There's a fire just off to your left hand side. You see the smoke? It makes you wonder. If you take the roadway and you just look, there's a lump of countryside and in the middle of the countryside there's this huge blaze that even at this time of night you can see sending smoke spiralling up into the sky. And that could have been the English burning out some Scot who refused to give them their land or who wouldn't feed them or who wouldn't give them their daughter to entertain them. A lot of Scotland was burning back then. There was a lot of injustice. And if little Willie Wallace could make claim to being a member of one of Scotland's minor knightly families, still rather impoverished, yet better off than most at a time when the powerful Stuart family ruled the roost. They'd been given the land by King David I of Scotland, so they could pretty much do as they pleased. He was the second son of Malcolm Wallace Oh, she's actually, uh, can I just say, the Seat driver is a rather glamorous blonde lady, so that's who drives them. <laughs> Slow down, let her overtake us again. <laughs> anyway, Wallace was the second son of Malcolm Wallace of Ellerslie, yet even that claim creates a ruckus. In Scotland, the good people of Eldersley near Paisley say that Wallace lived there, yet the rather obscure estate of Ellerslie or Eldersley near Kilmarnock in Ayrshire declares 
That's the true home of Wallace. Both places loaded with plaques claiming evidence of his being there. In his young days, he was taught to fight and gathered around him a gang of friends who'd sworn to be loyal for all times. Haven't we all had gangs like that? You hang around street corners, we're always going to be loyal. You never tell anybody your secrets. What goes on to us stays on to you and all that kind of stuff. Because this was a time of betrayal, when the only way that some could become rich was to sell out your friends, sell out your neighbours, maybe even sell out your own family to the English or to rival clans. Many believe it was because this time in history was known as the days of no trust, a time when the Celtic people were so obsessed with loyalty they wouldn't allow the days of no trust to break them up. So how did Wallace become the man that he did? Well, in his early teens, this group of friends did as much as they could to mess with the English overlords. And I suppose it was only going to be a matter of time that there'd be some kind of confrontation. Many Scots, particularly Scottish towns and cities, were given an Englishman to act as constable to keep order and justice. English justice, that is. And when the constable for Dundee, a man called Selby, came to play, his son was frankly overbearing, rude, and downright cruel. Now, there are several stories of how he used to rape young girls, always denying the claim, saying all oh, was a plot against him by the Scots, just trying to discredit the Englishman. However, there were no doubt children as young as nine had been defiled. This was a time when marriages could be arranged as young as 11 and 12. And to be honest, if you think that's outrageous, in Britain, you were allowed to get married at the age of 12, 100 years ago. Seriously? 1906 to 1910, you could still get married at the age of 12. But the fact is, whichever way you paint it, rape at any age is wrong. And for such a young child, it would cost the rapist his life in any Scottish court, but not when a rich Englishman was in the dock. He would never even get to the dock. Especially if your father was the constable and could overrule the claims so that the case would never even reach the ears of the magistrate. Young Selby also demanded free drink in all of the local hostelries. If refused, he would threaten the landlord with imprisonment for smuggling, even if he'd never smuggled a thing in his life. In fairness, though, most innkeepers obtained alcohol and wine from wherever they could get it, and even those totally law-abiding tenants could never prove where they'd got their barrels of hooch and booze. The constable's son behaved as if he was the ruler of Dundee, and it angered all of the Scots, but especially young Wallace. There's various stories of how this confrontation occurred, yet I'm picking my favourite, the one that rings most true. Young Selby had roughly grabbed and fondled a young girl on the main street through Dundee. And when a young Scotsman rushed to defend her, Selby drew a knife and slashed the man across his face. Then, as he fell to the ground, he began kicking him in the head over and over again, saying, and it's a phrase that I hate, Do you know who I am? Ugh. You will die for this, he said. Now, in Scotland, if you are English, you are right, even if you are very much in the wrong. Because of such things, the nation was always close to rebellion. That day, up strode the rebel with a cause, young William Wallace. He demanded an apology from Selby for the lady, and demanded that he help the Scot to his feet. Selby says, are you mad, or do you just seek to die too? My father is constable of Dundee. He'll swear a warrant for you this day. You will hang, and your land and the land of your family will be seized. Be sure you really wish to involve yourself in this matter. These words would dissuade most people from interfering in what was, well, a commonplace contretemps for this unpleasant oath. And even then, as a teenage lad, Wallace just got the mood right. You are in my country. You seek to ruin the flowers of Scottish womanhood whilst putting down its men 
barked Wallace. Perhaps you just have not met a true Scotsman yet. Well, today you have, and I shall not take a backward step. So you do as I say, and you can run back and hide behind your daddy's skirts. Do not, and you will die here and now. Now, for anybody to say that to you at any time, even today, it would make you think twice. Young Selby was shaken by the very first ever challenge to his will, and he looked at the man in front of him. He was so much smaller than the Englishman, and more to the point, he was unarmed. The constable, his father, was in the castle at the end of the street, and there were regular patrols. I will give gold to whoever arrests this man, and we will see how he behaves when the iron's been across his chest. Selby's arrogance was beyond belief. Not a single Scot moved. Gold aplenty to those who fetch soldiers now. This I promise. He said that swallowing perhaps a bit heavily, as once again, nobody moved. The situation was fast getting out of his control, and he knew it. Still, pride made him draw his sword. In his other hand, the knife he'd used to slash the young Scot. Wallace began to smile, unsettling the Englishman and forcing him to act. He darted forward and brought down the sword as Wallace moved to one side, tripping Selby and sending him onto the cobbled street into horse dung and mud. As the crowd laughed, up jumped Selby, roaring in anger, as Wallace grabbed the arms of the much bigger man. Big he may have been, but not strong. Wallace had had arms strengthened by felling trees and from sword work using double-handed swords. His forearms were as wide as a young boy's waist. As he looked into his adversary's eyes, he could see the panic beginning to well. He knew he'd already won. He knew this was him striking the first major blow for Scotland, the people, and for himself. He'd heard so many stories about this vile brute, and now he was his judge, his jury, and his executioner. With the flat of his fist, he hammered it down on his face, breaking his jaw as it hung limply from his face. The huge man was now weeping and trying to flee. He dropped both of his weapons and was now concentrating on getting away. He tried to plead for his life, but the damage to his jaw only allowed him to make an unintelligible row. Wallace tripped him again, and as he lay there, he bent his leg and stamped on the joint, breaking it. As Selby tried to drag himself away, Wallace did his other leg too with a sickening crack as the bone broke and jutted through the skin and the knee jerked out of its joint. Blood gushed from his mouth as the skin at the side of his mouth was ripped open and the man began shaking uncontrollably. He was in shock and was helpless to stop the assault. If there is a man or woman here prepared to speak for this man, I shall spare him, shouted Wallace. A young woman dragged out her young daughter. Her face was bruised and battered, her nose broken. She looked around eight years of age and the mother cried out, This is what he did to my bairn after he'd taken her womanhood. Kill the bastard. The crowd roared in agreement. By this time, two soldiers had arrived to see what the racket was, but seeing Wallace covered in Selby's blood, his eyes wide and staring, they decided to stand back. Wallace walked over to Selby as he began to scream and cry. Look at that child. Any real man would give his life to protect her, but not ye. I am not the one killing ye this day. Tis that bonny bairn. At that, Wallace turned him over and began punching his already battered face. Then, as the life began to leave him, he rammed blows onto his windpipe, shattering and flattening his Adam's apple. By then, his head was loose and floppy. His spine had snapped. 
and young Selby was dead. The crowd, empowered by this, came up to his body and spat on it and kicked it, even though the soldiers were watching. Wallace took out the Englishman's purse and threw it to the child's mother and began to walk away. Many historical books say that he made his escape from Dundee. Yet the truth was, he was pretty much cheered all the way. The soldiers who'd witnessed this reported the incident, saying that they had arrived too late to save Selby. His father was furious and sent out patrols to apprehend Wallace, yet on seeing what he'd done to a much bigger man, some say they looked everywhere they knew he wouldn't be. <laughs> yet two English soldiers hunting for him inadvertently found him. They were hungry and <laughs> it's like, you can imagine this being every English soldier's nightmare. Because the last English soldier that saw him, he was covered head to toe in blood, staring wildly after just taking down, barehanded, a man with a sword and a knife that was twice his size. You just didn't want to find him. Wherever he was, you wanted to be somewhere else. Yet these two English soldiers were hungry and they noticed a Scotsman fishing on Irvine water, as many a fisherman still does today. The English always took what they wanted, so they thought this was an easy meal to steal. They approached the Scots, saying, Give us half your catch, or you'll be floating dead in that water. That would scare away the fish, he replied. But it's took me four hours to catch what little I have. Pay me, and I'll give you one. Both Englishmen drew their swords as Wallace stood up and put his little wooden rod on the bank. He drew his sword with such a speed that he'd practically beheaded one of the men before either of them had time to respond. The other was so shocked, he just stood there staring at his friend falling to the ground, his head hanging down his back with a gaping wound spurting blood with every heartbeat. He didn't fight back. He just seemed to stare as Wallace wedged his sword into his chest and twisted it. He placed his foot on the dying man's chest and heaved out his blade, letting the man join his friend, dead in the rough heather. Three days later, Wallace had been hiding in an old woman's cottage, and in the night, the English surrounded him. He clambered into the barn as it was attached to the house, and he sat on a small cart. He set it on fire and then drove it out into the English, showering them all with burning straw. On another occasion, he escaped by dressing in an English soldier's uniform, and such became his legend. Dozens of places all over this area of Scotland are now named after him. Woods, caves, streams and hills where he had adventures all now carry the Wallace brand throughout South and Southwest Scotland. Of course, in England, he was merely described as a bandit or a brigand. I suppose nowadays a terrorist he'd be considered. But only because everything he did was out of resentment for the fact that his country was under the boot of a foreign power. The Scottish clan chiefs of that time seemed to be unwilling to upset or confront King Edward. His nickname was Longshanks, the Hammer of the Scots. You'll remember him for our various tales at Chillingham Castle. There's the King Edward room where Edward regularly stayed. He was a brutal man. And you know, I think maybe now's the time to tell you something that they never managed to get away in the Braveheart film. The big problem was the Scottish lords, the clan chiefs, would never fight alongside Wallace. In fact, a great many of them, including Robert the Bruce, who would later turn against the English, even the Bruce fought with the English. And why? Because the English were clever. The main Scottish clan chiefs, they invited down to London. They wined them, they dined them. And they said, if you show loyalty to the English king, we'll give you some land in England. And they gave them estates in England. Now, if the Scots were to fight the English, they would lose all of that land. They would lose all of their riches. Even if it would set Scotland free, they'd lose money. 
That's exactly what it was. It was down to greed. However, this brutal king, Longshanks, quite happy to massacre men, women and children, rather than risk yet another Scottish rebellion. Wallace was one of the world's first patriots, although when he lived, there was no such word as patriot back then. As he watched his country suffering and decided he was going to do whatever he could to free it and give his people their pride back, it was bred into him. His uncle was a priest in Dunapace and had taught him a Latin phrase that he would remember all of his life. He would even quote it on the day of his death. Dico tibi verum, libertus optima rerum. And this means, I tell you truly, liberty is the best of things. William Wallace was a terrorist, a fully-fledged guerrilla determined to fight anyone who was against Scotland or the Scottish. He and his ever-growing band of supporters was determined to destroy English garrisons in cities, towns and villages wherever he found them. His men were not just keen Scots, they were battle-hardened warriors and a formidable force at that. Disciplined and frightening. No rabble or hodgepodge of well-intentioned souls. This growing army knew how to kill and fight. He spent years marauding across Scotland, killing Englishmen and driving their families back across the border. He would attack castles at will and then hand them over to the Scottish lairds for safekeeping. Time after time, Wallace proved his bravery and on one occasion, alone, surrounded by 20 or so English troops, kept them at bay with his double-handed sword that he swung one way, then another, hacking off arms, legs and heads. But maybe the thing that he had was a charisma, a physical presence to inspire the people. He was a natural leader. He'd also grown bigger and much more powerful as the most reputable history of the time. It's the historical document. It's called the Scotochronicon. It wrote of him, He was a tall man with the body of a giant, cheerful in appearance with agreeable features, broad-shouldered and big-boned with a belly in proportion and lengthy flanks, pleasing in appearance but with a wild look, broad in the hips, with strong, sturdy legs and arms, a most spirited fighting man, with all of his limbs strong and firm. He was not the five foot ten inches of a Mel Gibson. He was a far more powerful and intimidating soul. Another historian, Blind Harry, who travelled with Wallace, said, He was seven feet tall, a third part of that length with his mighty shoulders. For broad was he. And we are approaching the first place we need to be. I'm going to be getting out of the car next. So we know who he was. We know the roots from whence he came. I'm taking back one of his soldiers, Kenny, to the place where he would fight and kill for the brave heart. Alan Robson walking in the footsteps of Braveheart. William Wallace killed 50 men. 50 efforts were done. A hundred men with his own sword cut through them like Moses through the Red Sea. Metro Radio. Alan Robson walking in the footsteps of the bereaved heart. Twice as long as a man. That long? Eh? Some men are longer than others. So, let's have a listen to Kenny's regression. 
what happened when he was 17 years of age. Tell me exactly everything that you can see. Green fields and hills. Green fields and hills. And can you see any people there? There's lots of people there. Lots of people. What are they wearing? They're wearing, it's, it's like men, but they've got skirts on, like kilts. Like kilts? Are they tartan or are they made of other material? They're tartan and, and they've got axes and, and spears and that kind of thing. Can you look down at your feet? What are you wearing on your feet? It's like just a material. It's like material. Is it tied around your feet? It is tied around. Are you male or female? Male. You're male. How old are you? 17. You're 17. And what else are you wearing apart from these cloth shoes? It's like a, a piece of material goes over my shoulder and tied around the waist. Right. And you can see green fields and trees. Can you see any houses there? It's like a, I'd say a hamlet. It's like a hamlet. Do you live there? You used to live there. You used to live there. Now you're 17. So why are you there now? We're fighting. You're fighting? Who are you fighting with there? Seems to be another clan. Another clan? So they've come to your hamlet and are you fighting against them? First we were fighting against them, but now we're fighting together. You're fighting together? And who are you fighting with? An invader. An invader? And who are the invaders? Better dressed, better dressed and... Do they have armour? They have pieces of metal that, that sort of cover parts of the body. Right, do they wear helmets? Yeah, they've got helmets. they got helmets. And you're fighting with these people? You're fighting with them. With other clans? What clan do you belong to? McGregor. You're a McGregor, are you? And all the McGregors are fighting with other people now? They're fighting against these people. They're English. They're English? Where do you live? I used to live in that hamlet, but now we have to hide in the hills. Now you have to hide in the hills. How many of you are there? Of our clan, it's 24. It's 24 in our clan. And you've teamed up with all the others? Yes, yeah, so there's hundreds of us now. And you all have to hide in the hills? We have to hide because they're trying to seek us out. They're trying to seek you out. And what would they do if they found you? They would kill us. They'd kill you? And have you seen people die there? Lots of people have died. How? How were they killed? They've been axed, they've been murdered, been burned out of their homes. And why did you eventually leave that hamlet? I had to because they come to ours to, to attack ours as well. We had to escape. They knew we were there. They knew you were there. And what weapon do you have on you? I have a, an axe and it's made out in stones. And, and stones? Yeah. And you, you throw stones? Throw stones at them. You throw Anything we can get to to stop them invading. And whereabouts are they based? They've they've come to they've come to our land. Right. Uh, but they don't live here. They camp. They camp. So they've come from the south and they've come into Scotland. What town are you from? Did, does the hamlet have a name? It's just on the borders. It's on the borders, is it? Are they invading your hamlet now? Or have they already invaded it? They've already invaded. They've invaded it. Were many killed there? Lots were killed. What did they do with the women? They raped them. They raped the women. And did they kill them or did they let them live? They killed them afterwards. Killed them afterwards. What about the children? The children. Some escaped, but again, most were killed. Most were killed. They're laughing at us. They're laughing at you? They think it's clever to stop us to grow up and to be better warriors. So they are stamping you out, trying to exterminate you. Yeah. And they were laughing at you. So what happened after they burnt out the hamlet and killed all the people there? What happened afterwards? We escaped to the hills and regrouped and joined up again. Right, with other warriors from other clans. Yeah. Do you really think that you can chase the English out? We're trying very hard, but there's so many of them. So many. So many and they've got so many weapons and horses and... So much armory we haven't. Right, so all you can do is is just try and capture us or kill as many as you can. Because there's too many of them for you to wipe out. Yeah. So what happened after this? We you went back into the hills. We went back to the hills, regrouped and planned to try and attack the English. Whereabouts? 
in their camp. They're in their camp, but they're marching forward. They're trying to seek out, seek out more of our clan. So are they marching into Scotland? They are marching into Scotland. Are you in the hills or are you near the coast? We're near a stream at the minute. You're near a stream. What does it look like? Describe it to us. It's, it's a very small stream and it leads out to like a copse, like lots of trees. And we're worried that they're going to come from that direction. Right. So what are you doing to try and protect yourselves? We're trying to hide into more woods and find more trees and barriers and barricade them away from us. And what weapon do you use? I have... I still have... Because you're 17. Sword. It's like a little sword, very but it's, it's very heavy. It's got... It's tied with... It's got a string. Right, so it's string around it. Yeah. And you're 17, are you Are you tall, are you small? I'm quite small compared to the rest of the clan. But strong enough to carry these things. You have to be brave. You have to be brave. What happened to your family? My family were killed. How? The English killed them. They came to the hamlet. We ran, I got away out the back. But they stayed in and they were burnt. And who, who were burnt? Who, who, which members of your family? My mother was burnt, my father was running out the door. He was set alight as he was running out the door and he was, he tried to get to the stream. But they, they pulled him down and laughing, and they were laughing at him. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I had two brothers and one sister. It's all right. She's too young. How did your brothers die? My brothers tried to run out and warn the family right. that they were coming. They were lookouts. They were lookouts. And did the English catch them? They caught them. And what did they do to them? They tortured them and killed them. Tortured them? How did they torture them? What did they do? They tied them up to a tree. Ah. Uh -huh. And they tied to the tree. Fine arrows at the tree. They fired arrows at the tree. But they didn't kill them straight away. They sort of injured them first. They injured them first, so they weren't shooting to kill. No. And then what did they do? And they set the tree alight. They set the tree on fire to finish them off. And did you see this clearly? I was running away. I went on to go back and help. There's too many English, too many of them, and I just had to try and warn the family. But I didn't make it. You didn't make it. You know you're getting upset now. Yeah. Because you loved them very much, didn't you? Very much. Loved them very much. And that made you even more sure to try and fight them and keep them away as best you can. So, what I want you to do now is to move forward and let me, in, in time a little bit, and tell me precisely what happened. You said you were making a plan to try and get some of the English soldiers as they were marching. They were marching into Scotland. Yeah. What happened? Some of them came away from the main group, and when they were away from the main group, again at the stream, we attacked them. We attacked them at this time. We killed them. How many of them were there? There were seven of them in the group. Seven of them? And did you kill any of them? Uh, don't actually kill them. The rest of them killed them, but I finished one of them off who was down, who tried to get back up and kill one of our clan. And, but when he was down, you went and finished him off. How finished did you do off. that? I, st I stuck a sword in him. You stuck a sword in him? back. What did it feel like to kill one of these people who'd killed your family? Very strange, but at the same time, to kill them, I was claiming life back. It was like claiming, remember my family's life, back for us. That's right. what it felt like. Now, there were seven of them. The rest of the English were somewhere else. What happened after you'd killed these seven English soldiers? After we killed them, we took heart from this, and the rest of the clan, the story spread. We told the rest of the clans to meet up, and as we got all together, we attacked the English at night, late at night. Were they camped up, or were they marching? They camped up. They had fires, fires next to the camp, huh? like torches. Yeah. Uh, Roughly how many ca tents did they have? Was there five? Was there more than five? How many? More than five. Twenty, twenty odd tents in there. Right. But there was also this line on the land as well, but we, we attacked from behind. What happened? When you go into this camp, it's late at night, the fires are lit, they've got torches, there's twenty odd tents there. What happened when they you did. got... They didn't expect us. They didn't right. expect us attacking them. We attacked them from behind. Burnt their tents with them in. With them inside. <sighs> lots of fighting. Lots of fighting, lots of blood. Lots of blood. <sighs> Are you here to talk? Not yet. Uh, Not yet. I'm sort of more to one side. So lots of battles, lots of fighting. Lots of fighting. <sighs> but the English are running. They're running. 
In what direction are they running? They're running away from us. They're running down, down. They're up down towards again to the stream. We're chasing them, chasing them. There's more of us coming down the hill. Yeah. And are you shouting? We're shouting a battle cry. What does that sound like? What does a battle cry sound it's like? It's like a roar, like just a roar. But as we're doing it, everyone is together and feeling good. We're chasing the English away from our land. What's happening now? Your chest getting tight. What's happening? There's, there's, there's lots. There's lots of killing, but they're all running. There's some laying wounded, dying. Some of our clan dying as well. Yeah. But we're joyous. Well, have you chased them away yet? The ones that aren't dying have run. We've run them out. We are whooping. You're whooping. And feeling We're celebrating good. victory. Celebrating. We've chased them for the first time ever. We've chased them from our land. And you're all celebrating victory. What do you do to celebrate? We cheer. We're embracing each other. Cut our swords in the air. Uh -huh. And now you're in the English camp and it's your camp now. We've chased them, but don't know. We know that they're going to come back again. We know they'll be back. We just know that we've defeated the English. And now we're making plans again to get more clans together, more of our people together. You're on the borders. Do you know where the biggest town is from where you are? Coldstream. Coldstream is the nearest town, is it? It is that the stream you're talking about? That is the stream. It's the stream. You're at the Cold Stream, and that's where the town gets its name. And are the English in Coldstream? They have marched up there. They've sent an army out to try and repel us and, and rid of us and get us out of the land, but... But you've chased them away. They didn't succeed this time. So you celebrate, and do you sleep in that camp, or do you go back to the hills that night? We need to go back to the hills, because the English will send more Aye. of their people out and they'll find these people dead. Right. So you've had this amazing experience where you've fought off and killed the English and chased them away and reclaimed more lives of your family and paid them back. That must feel good, does it? It feels really good. We're a clan. And are you, are you hurt? Are you cut? Are you bloodied? My hands cut. Yeah. Uh, my head's bleeding. Your head's bleeding. Uh, but we don't feel the wounds. So we're going to move forward again. You move back into the hills and you've come back to this particular place because something happened. We've already heard amazing things, battles that you fought with the English, how your family were wiped out and you have sought to seek revenge for their deaths. Alan Robson. Alan Robson, walking in the footsteps of the Braveheart. The answer to your question is yes. You fight for me, you get to kill the English. Excellent! Finally, finally here. Alan Robson with you. <sighs> Walking in the footsteps of William Wallace. I have to tell you about something that we did earlier 
in the day before we came on this late night trail we went around to get photographs of some of the places that we're visiting tonight one of them that we're not going up at this time of night because the whole thing's closed off is the Wallace Monument. It's at Abbey Craig, just on the opposite hillside to Stirling Castle. And can I just tell you, there's a bus that takes you all the way up to the top of the hill to the monument. Get the bus. <laughs> Get the bus. You might think, but I'm really fit. Get the bus because Kenny and I we may not be the fittest human beings on the planet but we're pretty yeah, we're pretty buff I'm, uh, between us we're pretty buff yeah. and with a closeness and it was kind of equatorial just getting up to the top of the hill and then you get to the Wallace Monument and you've got to climb about four and a half thousand <laughs> stairs to get to the top of the thing we were lathered but we're tenacious and we're carrying on because now we're just getting out of the car now the sadness maybe of this is that it's pretty close to a fairly main road and even at this time of night there's cars I don't know whether you can hear car just going by there and we've got to walk along this track to the next part of our story I'm just saying stairs ahead of us but it's actually away from the road and from this vantage point you can see the next part of the Wallace Trail in fact we'll get a photograph of the rickety old stairs that we got to go through because in the eyes of the English William Wallace was probably viewed as a terrorist a guerrilla fighter who did everything he could to make their lives as miserable as possible now so many years on his exploits have trebled and quadrupled with the spin that any beloved legend accelerates. The truth is he was a major thorn in the side of any claims by the English king that Scotland belonged to him. Innocent travellers would be robbed and often allowed to go on in peace. Those with a military guard would always be slain, yet they'd never kill the women or the children. On the other hand, if the English suspected any family of hiding Wallace or his men, they'd all be butchered. On one occasion, actually not far from where we're standing now, overlooking the valley, main road on my left-hand side, about 50 yards, you can probably hear it. But it was close to here that a, a sterling woman and her seven children were put to the sword because they found an English soldier sword in a nearby stream. Now, the English rationale was, if the soldier didn't have his sword, he must be dead. If he's dead, somebody killed him. If you've got their sword, must have been you. It's tenuous at best. But that's the way that it was back then. It was around this time that Wallace took himself a braid, a beautiful red-headed heiress called Marion Braidfoot from Lanark. This was another humiliating episode for the king as Lanark was an English stronghold. Wallace regularly visited the town in disguise under the nose of the English sheriff based there. His name was Sir William Heselrig and there they fell in love and a pagan ceremony conducted. He actually proposed in the bridge of Stirling, so when you drive through Stirling and you head towards the Wallace Monument, you actually drive over that bridge, I come very close to it in any case. So, pagan ceremony, they were hand fasted, and soon after a daughter was born to them. So technically their ancestors still remain in Scotland to this day. Of course, running a farm's a lot of work. But... Well, that'll all change when my sons arrive. So you've got children? Not yet, but I was hoping that you could help me with that. So you want me to marry you now? Well, that's a bit sudden, but all right. Is that what you call a proposal? I love you. Always have. I want to marry you. The soldiery of Lanark became aware that Wallace was in the area after listening to a drunken Scot bragging that he'd shared ale with Wallace the night before to wet the baby's head. As the inn was near the edge of town, soldiers lay in wait there, near a dark, dark lane, because that was the nearest entrance and exit point. A group of nine men, Wallace included, approached Lanark, and the sergeant at arms challenged them, Drop your weapons and prepare to be searched, he bellowed. We seek the coward, William Wallace. At that, Wallace stepped forward, as about 30 English troops stepped out of the trees. Completely outnumbered, completely surrounded, 
Wallace behaved like he always did, in the wildest and most over-the-top manner. He threw back his cloak and said, I am the Wallace, and who are you to challenge me on my own soil? Had away him to where you come from, you Sassanac bastard. At this, he drew a claymore and a small sword, and using them like scissors, he took the man's head off. At that, the Scots burst in all directions, running into the soldiers and making them scatter in shock and panic. The Scots then thought better of visiting Lanark that night, but did keep returning. Heselrig was humiliated and had Marion seized and put to death. Various accounts of how she was dispatched exist, yet it's generally thought that after giving Heselrig a tirade of abuse, he ordered his guards to simply hack her to death in the town square. Others, keener on native propaganda, claimed Heselrig ordered his retinue of 300 men to rape her to death, declaring, each man will have taken what the Wallace values so dear. Either way, she was not buried. Her flesh was fed to the dogs. The bones that remained were interred at a later date at a church not far from here. The so very civilised English could have learned so much from the chivalrous Scots who would never kill or harm women or children, not whilst Wallace was their chieftain. As we walk along here, you can get a feeling of the countryside swamped all around. The cars just kind of take the edge away, the modern world intruding on this trip back into the past. William Wallace, you can imagine, he's just heard that the woman that he loved beyond all else had been killed in such a horrendous way, however she went. He was in a murderous fury as grief struck him and he refused to wait for his armies to gather. That night, his men infiltrated Lanark, entering the town in ones and twos, and then, as the night began to blacken, they gathered and forced their way into Hesselrig's residence. Now, despite it being guarded by over 40 men, every single one was killed. Wallace burst into Heselrig's bedroom, finding the portly sheriff in his bed. Such was his rage, Wallace flew at the shocked Englishman, and it was said that his body was so mutilated, not one piece of his body remained less than a few inches square, apart from his head. That Wallace grasped by the hair and carried it through Lanark, holding it up towards anyone he saw. The English troops rallied, and as they flew towards Wallace's men, they were cut down. It was a massacre of the English. Though Wallace and his renegades took full credit, it was thought that the Scots in Lanark supported him. They'd been disgusted in the murder of Marion Braidfoot and hated the English, so they'd just waited for their opportunity to get stuck in and maybe get even on his behalf. And you know, it was that attack, an attack over a matter of the heart, that lit the blue touch paper for the revolt that followed. The Scots realised for once they could defeat the English. The king was stunned that such audacity had been shown, and it sent shockwaves through every English garrison in Scotland. This stung the English so badly that at Wallace's eventual trail, the very first charge would not be that he defeated massive English armies, it would be the murder of Heselrig, arson and sacrilege. The English always ignored their crimes, because they were English, so therefore they could do what they liked. The trigger for the great Scottish revolt had been pulled. The aristocratic Scots, including John Stuart, the steward, and Robert Wishart, the Bishop of Glasgow, and a very, very young Robert the Bruce, tried to get the rich Scots into the insurrection. But theirs fizzled out. The wealthy Scots chose not to risk losing their lands in England by challenging the king, and those who rose up were totally humiliated by Sir Henry Percy from Annick, Sir Robert Clifford, who marched their men up into the borders and surrounded the Aristo Scots near air. A negotiation took place, and the wealthy Scots surrendered without a fight. They had to give hostages, mostly their children who went away to the English court and therefore would promise to fight for England against the French. The common Scots, the ordinary men and women, were on their own again. And in the northeast of Scotland, Andrew Murray who was actually French, Andrew de Moray was his name. He was the son of a local baron from the Common family. They both had been captured in the battle for Dunbar and imprisoned. They managed to escape from Chester Castle, found their way back up to Scotland to the family seat at Avoc in Russia. One by one, they managed to capture all of the English-held castles in that area. And before long, he was in control of all of the lands around Aberdeenshire and Moray. 
All the way, of course, Wallace continued to chip away at the English control over Scotland. He had a hand-picked band of fighters, the most savage and terrifying, designed not only to raise local support, but to put panic in the hearts of anyone daring to face them. All great horsemen, too. And he would lead his hellish band towards Scone, where the crowning stone for all of the Scots stood proud. This land was held by William Ormsby, the English Justiar of Scotland, who had outlawed any Scot not loyal to the king. Well, on seeing this band of creatures roaring towards them, Ormsby's troops just took off and left him no choice but to flee to Edinburgh, where he for weeks, then sneaked back into Northumberland to his family estate. In Scotland, the English were totally under siege. Wherever they were, they were under attack. King Edward, who was far more interested in using his armies against the French, decreed that the uprising in Scotland had to be put down. He ordered the death and the destruction of all property of anyone, young or old, rich or poor, who refused to give him their loyalty. He ordered his most experienced warriors, the old Earl of Surrey, who had crushed the Scots at Dunbar. Hugh Cressingham was ordered to raise a northern army to march to Stirling to support the English who were on the verge of being driven out. Most of the troops were drawn from farms and townships in New... Say, we say, Northumberland. Not exactly the fighting elite, but sufficiently worried about the Scots. The truth was, if the Scottish had been left alone, Northumberland had nothing to fear from the average north of the borderman. They were very alike. It was only the greed of the English king that had made their daily lives so perilous. When Wallace heard that the English army was marching towards them, he smiled and broke off his siege of Dundee Castle and sent word to Murray to join him. They met up at Perth, uniting their forces, and here, right where I'm standing now, at Stirling, they would wait for the inevitable confrontation that all Scotland had expected. All of Britain held its breath. Steps of the brave heart. You tell your king that William Wallace will not be ruled, and nor will any Scot while I live.
Now, at the present moment, we're walking up a, a track, to be honest. You've got to be careful, Kenny. There's nettles either side. You don't, don't get stung. And it's all overgrown. The trees have ivy climbing right the way up the stems, which always looks quite spooky, especially at this time of night. A huge tree on my left-hand side with huge knots sticking out. In a hole there, you can just picture a, a little tiny owl sitting, watching for prey as the moths flutter around. There's hardly any light here at all. There's a little bit of moonlight. There's lots of... <coughs> Excuse me. Just on saying that, he swallows one of the small flies that I was just about to tell you about. And when you breathe in here, because... And yes, we're not too far away from roads, and it's a fairly main road that links Stirling to Glasgow that's to my right-hand side. Can't be helped. Doesn't matter. It's here, on this spot, where it all kicked off. The great battle of Stirling Castle. And... There's a little stale here that I'll sit on. Old-fashioned stale with a, a little fence to stop dogs getting in. But if you lift the wooden post, it lifts the gap at the bottom to allow dogs through. Well, there's no dogs this time. Kenny and I are going to sit on it and probably nettle our backsides while we do it. This is the place where you fought your battles, Kenny. This is where we heard the first part of your regression mm -hmm. you were age 17 yeah we're a few years on now four years later in fact when you were fighting mm -hmm. with the scots and wallace you know when you had that regression i can't remember you ever mentioning the name wallace you were just fighting with the scots and you were fighting perhaps more specifically for your clan yeah i think it was more or less fighting for my clan against other scottish clans and then eventually uh, ended up fighting against yeah. the English, yeah. And this is where it happened. We're going to hear how Kenny fought and what he saw. You're very, very lucky because never before have you ever been able to speak to an eyewitness of the Battle of Stirling Castle. Tonight you're going to hear it as it happened. And when you stand here high above the crest of Abbey Craig north of Stirling, there's 226 steps up the circular staircase of the monument. When we were up there earlier today, you could feel a bloody history of the place. And the lookout platform on the top, it lets you see the full panorama of the battlefield. In the south, Stirling Castle standing proud on a huge slab of dollar right, imposing, terrifying for any enemy seeking to gain entry. The River Forth winding its way over the flatland. It's a place where over tens of thousands of years people have lost their lives fighting for control of one of the most strategically important sites in all Scotland. For centuries, Stirling was the last place you could cross the river until the Kincardine Bridge was erected in 1936. Yet the Wallace Battle took place where the old bridge stands, to this day linking the town to the causeway towards the Bridge of Allen. But prior to that, it had been known as the sacred pagan bridge called the Brig of Trey, where this encounter is taking place. We're looking down over the valley. There's a huge swathe of flat land. There's the river winding round, cutting through it. And there you see the bridge. Now surrounded by buildings and surrounded by the blasted motorway that's maybe a hundred metres behind me, but still loud enough to be ever constant. Wallace and Murray were at Stirling long before the English. They took up position on Abbey Craig, where the Wallace Monument is now, and the area around it, heavily treed. So no army could see them, but they could see the approaching army. Despite not being huge, it must have looked terrifying. The English front ranks of experienced soldiers and mercenaries designed to cut through the enemy, dividing it and allowing the foot soldiers to enter the fight. Two hundred warriors, knights on horseback, leading ten thousand footmen, all well equipped and armed to the teeth. There to stop them, thirty-six Scots on horses and 8,000 ordinary Scots. Few trained in the art of war, but all desperate to defend their homeland. They knew if the English defeated them, their towns and villages would be sacked again. Their women and children defiled again. And they'd be sentenced to live under the iron fist of the English again. The night before the battle, James the Steward, who brought the name Stuart 
into parlance, and Malcolm, the Earl of Lennox, both Scots loyal to England, agreed to seek parley with Wallace. On approaching his camp under a white flag, Wallace ordered his men to show their disapproval of the Scots who had betrayed their country. They were pelted with rotting fruit, mud and excretia, and they made a hasty and undignified retreat as the Scots all bent away from them and raised their kilts to show their backsides. The English, who knew a battle would diminish their army when they needed men to face the French, decided to seek a Scottish surrender by sending priests to offer terms. Wallace stood before them and declared, Tell your commander that we are not here to make peace, but to do battle, to defend ourselves and liberate our kingdom. Let them come on and we shall prove this in their very beards. Another historian claimed Wallace had said, if you wish to surrender, we will still bring death to each one of you, in part payment for the murder and rape of our countrymen. One of his men said, You dinner want to face the Wallace when he's in this fettle? His eyes blazed, and there was a confidence about him that seemed to flood through his men. It was as if they knew they could do it. Following yet another rebuff, the Earl of Surrey ordered his men to cross the bridge the following morning for a full frontal attack on the Scots. Then he retired to the English-held Stirling Castle. Do you know the English aristocrat had not even got out of bed when the English began to cross the river, deploying their foot soldiers in the marshy and sticky mud on the flat. On discovering his men falling over, sinking into the mire and being unable to stand, let alone fight, they were recalled. The Scots roared with laughter as these cracked troops couldn't walk. So how could they fight? The Scottish knights and the English ranks urged caution, believing that so few soldiers could cross the tiny bridge at any one time, they could easily be cut down. They thought it was a death trap, when only a few miles away was a ford where the knights could cross 60 at a time. The English were angry at their initial humiliation, so Cressingham, the obese treasurer of Scotland, ordered Surrey to hurry and get the battle started. Many think he did this knowing that by flanking the Scots from the ford, the Scots would disperse and it would take longer to defeat them. That would cost far more money out of his coffers, so instead he wanted things sorted out there and then. The bridge was so tiny only three horses could cross at a time, creating a huge queue. By midday only half of the army had reached the other side. Wallace had a broad smile on his face, unable to believe his luck. Half the English troops were still in the mud, the others trying to climb the rise whilst waiting for more of their force to cross. It was then the Scots blew a horn and the massed ranks of Scottish spearmen charged down the hill and along the raised causeway, now known as Causeway Head, towards the bridge. The English cavalry, also in the mud, unable to move, unable to fight at the same time. The Scots ran over the top of them, using their spiked dead as a walkway across the squelching mud. Within minutes, the end of the bridge was surrounded by the Scottish pikemen, giving no way for the panicked English to escape. So many bodies were piled at the bridge, the Scots had to hurl them into the river just to be able to get at the cowering enemy. The Scots had an afternoon of utter slaughter. Wallace's own retinue, all experienced fighters, decided to wade in with long swords and axes. They hacked off heads, split men down the middle, and generated such fear that it was said that some men fell on their own swords rather than face them. One Scot held up the head of an English aristocrat, declaring, The Wallace said we would be in their beards. Now I hold one in my hand. The seasoned campaigner, the Earl of Surrey, could only watch helplessly as the massacre continued. And I don't know whether you can imagine you as an individual in the middle of a field where thousands of men lie under your feet, cut, hacked, bleeding, blood oozing into the soil. And you stand there covered from head to toe in blood, splashed from the wounds that you've inflicted on other people or maybe some of the wounds inflicted on you. Every way you swished and slashed your sword, you were hitting somebody as you fought your way through. What's like, if you can imagine, English soldiers like stems of grass in a field and you are just brushing your way past them all as they tried to run and yet the mud under their feet would make them trip and you'd be down upon them. This was your country and you are claiming it back. 
The green flatland, awash with blood, the entire scene crimson. In the middle, many of the clansmen were so soaked with blood, it appeared as if they were camouflaged, wearing the essence of their enemy. In a single badly misjudged attack, half of his troops were butchered, lying in pieces across the battlefield or drowned in the deep waters of the fourth. One strand of knights led by Sir Marmaduke Twing. Who else but the English would have Sir Marmaduke Twing? They managed to force their way back to the bridge and across to safety, actually riding across some of their own men to do so. This was only successful as they rode over their own soldiers, killing dozens of them and making the rest jump into the river. And with their armour, that guaranteed a certain death. In desperation, Surrey ordered the bridge burnt down, once again killing numerous members of his own force who tried to run through the fire rather than be caught and hacked to pieces by the Scots. Picture the scene right here. We're guiding you in the footsteps of the Braveheart. If you were the English commanders, having hundreds drowned in mud, bodies floating face down in the river, arms, legs and heads decorating the field, and others aflame trying to reach safety. It had been a complete disaster. Twang took charge of the castle, whilst the rest of the army retreated to Berwick on the other side of the country. The fat Englishman Cressingham had led the first wave across the bridge, and he was an early casualty. He realised almost immediately he was about to die, so on his huge black horse, he charged into the approaching... Spio! Spider on my head, spider on my head. That was not good. No. That was a big guy. Mm -hmm. Whoa! <laughs> Hair on the back of my neck went up there, <laughs> spider went onto the floor, that was horrible. Are you getting eaten alive yet? Oh, yeah, loads of things on his... I don't know what, but... I can't actually There's see not even You've got one on your oh. page there, flick, flick it away. That's horrible. Oh, nasty. Jeepers. So Cressingham knew he was going to die, so essentially he was on his big black horse, so he raced towards the spearman. Now, the spears can be up to 20 feet long with a spike and then a little blade that kind of curls off as a U-shape beneath it. Once the spike went in, you are hooked rather like a fish hook works. You know, there's a blade going back on himself. He was pulled from his horse and literally cut to pieces. In 1851, Scott claimed to have his fat finger with a huge ring on it, his ancestor having cut it off following the battle. So many men had took time to take a hack at him. By the end of the day, he was no longer a man, he was more a bloody puddle. The English Lanacost Chronicle would later report that the overweight man's skin was taken from the battlefield and turned into a baldric, a belt slung over the shoulder to support the carriage of a weapon for Wallace's long sword. Fairly sure that didn't happen, but it sounds great. The official count of the dead was 100 knights and 5,000 foot soldiers had died. Truth is, it was probably more. But even then, the use of spin was used for damage limitation. The Scottish traitors, James the Steward and the Earl of Lennox, decided to attack the English they had fought alongside as they tried to get back to Berwick. They ended by stealing their horses, weapons and booty. What a victory for this raggle-taggle Scottish army pulled together by Wallace. They had given an immense psychological boost to the entire people of the country. None of the Scottish elite were part of it. This was a people's army. The wealthy Scottish landowners were either in English prisons or they'd been forced to swear allegiance to Edward of England. In one single hour, the legend of English invincibility had been destroyed forever by the common folk of Scotland. To be honest, as kind of a common bloke, I take great pride in that. And it's not being disloyal to England. It's just saying the common man stood up and they gave him some. And I'm really proud of that. The English claimed that it was not even a defeat. It was merely confusion, a battle without a clear result. The Scots knew the truth. Not only had they defeated the English war machine, they'd also spat in the face of Edward himself. Wallace and Murray, de Moray, were now pretty much the rulers of Scotland. And frankly, were not really sure precisely what they should do. Murray was badly wounded, a spear wound, an arrow strike and two stab wounds. His life hung on a thread. 
Numerous of their warriors needed time for their wounds to heal too. Incredibly, these supposedly naive Scots began sending letters to the governments across Europe seeking to open trade links for the newly independent nation of Scotland. They signed their names in Latin out of respect for the Eurocrats. Wilhelmus Walensis and Andreas de Moravia were now known on the continent, much to the shame of the English king. William Wallace led a huge and unruly Scottish army through Northumbria, going through Annick, going through Blythe, going through Newcastle and Cumbria in an orgy of vengeance, sacking Berwick, almost destroying the village, later to be known as Bedlington. Annick, Newcastle beyond, they went to Lanacos Priory near Carlisle, driving out the monks for their hypocrisy. It was said the monks were living the high life, abusing their power by creating a situation where young girls believed that having sex with a monk would bring them closer to God. They were stripped, whipped and chased out of town. Yet the English declared that the Scots had attacked Jesus Christ through the insult made to his representatives on earth. It was only fierce snowstorms that ended the Scottish rampage, and by Christmas, Wallace and his kinsmen were back in Scotland. There he was knighted and became guardian of the Kingdom of Scotland and the leader of its armies in the name of the illustrious Prince Lord John Balliol, by the grace of God, King of Scotland. It was hoped that the rich Scots and the clan chiefs would now rally to his side. Yet they saw Wallace as lowly born. There was no way that princes, earls and dukes of Scotland would ever bow to a commoner. To them he was not a hero. He was a young upstart who threatened their land, their wealth more importantly, and their standing. It was a petty jealousy towards a man who'd won Scotland back for his people. Many of these wealthy Scots owned land in England too. So now, what were they to do? Many of them went with the money to their eternal disgrace. The new Scotland seemed not to value the old nobility, yet Edward of England was steeped in loyalty towards it. So they began plotting with the English. As soon as Edward Longshanks, the Hammer of the Scots, had sorted out the war with Philippe, the Fair of France, he returned to give his full weight towards dealing with a brigand who had usurped his authority in Scotland. The king moved his capital from London to York and he summoned a council of war. The Scottish nobles all found excuses why they could not be there. The truth being that if they'd have gone with the English, their lands and monies would have been taken by Wallace. If they'd have gone with Wallace, their lands in England would have been taken by the king. But money was the root of this. But let's just move backwards, just a split second, to the heart of that battle. What was it like to be there? In a couple of minutes, you're going to be able to hear everything that Kenny experienced fighting in the middle of the Battle of Stirling Castle. Right here, Alan Robson, live from the battlefield of Stirling, walking in the footsteps of the Braveheart. Sons of Scotland, I am William Wallace. William Wallace is seven feet tall. Yes, I've heard kills men by the hundreds. And if he were here, he'd consume the English with fireballs from his eyes and bolts of lightning from his arse. <laughs> I am William Wallace. And I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men. And three men you are. What will you do without freedom? Will you fight? Hey, against that? No! We will run! And we will live. Die. Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to train all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom!
bit further in time, when you get a little bit older, do you live to be older than 70? Yes. How old are you? 21. You're 21 now, and you're a grown man. And are you still having to fight the English? Yeah. You're still fighting the English. We're bigger and stronger. Bigger and stronger now. Different leaders of different clans. I see. And when you're 21, something happens to you when you reach 21. What was that? It was a major battle. Major battle? We sent the English pack in this time. Uh Uh-huh. On a big scale. Big scale battle. Yeah? This time we were well prepared. Well prepared. We had the advantage we were above in the hills. Right. Looking down. And what happened at this battle? The English were down below and you had the advantage. It was a major battle, a major success. What happened? This time we didn't attack. They came forward at us. We were attacking from the sides this time. Yeah. They came round the sides and attacked us from the sides. Yes. But we were ready for this because as they attacked us, more clans came from the hills. Right. And as they attacked from the sides, they came from behind the English, attacked the English from behind again, got behind them in the sides. They attacked us first, and as they were coming, we beat them from the sides, and we attacked them from the front. Again, more fighting, so much fighting. How, d- how did you... St- stamped by a horse. How did you stop the horses? Long, long spears. Long spears. And were you stabbing the horses? Stabbing the horses, cutting them down, even cutting their legs. Cutting the legs so they fall off. Cutting the legs off so they fell. And then when they fell and the rider was down... We all attacked and besieged. So many people on top attacking. Tell me what you see. It's horrible. Your face is contorted. Just squashing. Heads being pulverised with stones. Uh, axes. Stamping on them. Stamping on, on their bodies. Are you running over their bodies? Just stamping on them, making sure they're dead and stamping on them. And you could feel that under your feet? Yeah. It's stamping awful. on Awful. It is. So what happens? Did Do you completely win another victory against the English? It's a long time, but they're retreating. They're retreating. They're retreating. We've run them back again over the stream. We've got them in the stream. We're trapped. They're trapped. So they're trapped in the stream. And what are you doing now to the English? They're in the stream. The horses can't get over there. Right. They're, they're sinking and drowning and, and they can't do it. And we've got them at the edge of the stream. The bows are useless now. The bows are useless. Fight them. They can't fight them. So what are you doing? We're stoning them. You're We're stoning, stoning them and killing them and slaying them. It's head chopped off. There's a head chopped off. Uh, what was that you just seen? Uh, just a head, a head lying, and rolling in the, st- in the side of the bank. Was it an English head or a... It was an English head. It was an English head. And what are you using to fight with? Oh, a big sword this time. Got a big sword. <laughs> and is it covered with blood? It's covered with blood, I'm covered with blood. Right. So what happens? The, the river. The river. The river's red. The river's red with blood. And bodies. And bodies. Have you lost many men? We've lost many men. Lots of men, but the English have lost more. We were. There was more English people that were numbered, but we, we have run them back again. Right. Chase them from our lands. Yeah. One of our leaders is dead. One of your leaders is dead. Right, can you remember your name? What were you called? William. William McGregor. And you're 21. Do they call you William? Call me Will. They call you Will. Will McGregor, and you're 21. Do you live longer than 21? I live till I'm 27. You live until you're 27. And how do you die? Battle. In battle.
kidding. We've just headed back into the car to head to our next destination. Walking, or in this case, driving. Hang on, seatbelt. We're going to do this live, so I'm afraid you're going to hear a few lumps and bumps as we... Hang on. Otherwise, that little bell will fire. There we go. Um, careful, there's a car behind you there. Ken parked up here. I think they're late night bonkers. <laughs> I think. Who else would be out here at this time of night? Parked up and at the side there. Are you married to the person who owns car S D O? Oh, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it. Right. Not going to do it. So an amazing regression with Kenny. And in July 1298, Edward crossed the Tweed at Coldstream and moved through Scotland with the biggest army the Scots had ever seen. There were 1,500 mounted knights fresh from their success in France, four brigades of men-at-arms and 12,000 seasoned foot soldiers, including a huge contingent of Welsh and English archers. The Scots used a scorched earth policy, destroying their lowlands so there was no food for such a large army. In all of the lowlands, all they found was one single skinny cow. The army was therefore forced to stop at Kirkliston, a few miles west of Edinburgh, to await provisions coming from Berwick, as soon as ships arrived from London. Most of the ships failed to appear, and those that did carried wine and not wheat. The army was soon starving and riddled with disease. The Welsh archers began to fight with the English, and much blood was shed as tempers frayed to breaking point. Priests were brought in to intervene and were promptly killed as the insanity continued. Edward's meticulously planned assault on Scotland was in big trouble. And it was the Scots' clever plan that had caused it. Edward was just about to fall back to Edinburgh when he heard the Scottish army was nearby. Two Scottish earls from Dunbar and Angus had betrayed Wallace, who was trying to gain a position to strike unnoticed. They were only 22 kilometres away in the great forests of Falkirk. Praise be to God, declared Edward. There shall be no need to follow me, for I shall go and meet them this very day. He began to march and finally set up his camp south of Linlithgow. In case the Scottish tried to surprise them, every knight slept with his horse tethered next to him, resting in full armour. During that night, his own stallion had booked and landed on him, breaking two of the king's ribs. Alarm spread as people said, Is the king dead? In an attempt to calm his unsettled and disease-riddled force, he strapped himself to his horse, sitting as straight as a ramrod in the saddle, and gave order to break camp. They were on their way to face the enemy. walking in the footsteps of the brave heart we've just passed the monument the wallace monument we've left that behind we can no longer see the flatland we're heading towards an area where some of wallace's own troops following this next battle would come and be helped as we head back 
through Stirling on the A91, if that's of any help. On the left-hand side in the darkness, there are fields with hay that have been bound in those big circular tube things that you see in fields. Small railway line off to your left-hand side that's now no longer used as a railway line. It's just a, a dead track. And to the left and to the right of the roadway, this forest as far as the eye can see. Spread down to flatlands beyond. Now before this battle began, Wallace was already badly let down. The Scottish elite, all with lands in England, refused to help with men, weapons or money in fear of the English king seizing their lands south of the border. High on the hill to the southeast of Falkirk, a group of spearmen sent forward as scouts spotted the huge English army heading towards them through a swirling Scottish mist. As soon as they were seen by the cavalry and pursued, the mist seemed to help them disappear. It's generally believed that one of these Scots had been Wallace himself, always the warrior furthest forward, leading his armies by example. The village of Wallace Town now proudly stands where he watched his enemy approach. The boulder, the Wallace Stone, has now sadly disappeared, but in its place is a tall pillar erected in 1810 in his memory. Imagine the terror you would feel, a member of one or two immense armies both in the same fog, knowing that at any moment you could be face to face with your most hated enemy. The Scots knew they were completely outnumbered, and with crude weapons in comparison to the English, Wallace must have been shocked. He expected to see the tail of the English army retreating to Edinburgh to stock up with provisions. We can presume his plan was to harass them and generate panic in their ranks to give the impression he'd chased them away. Instead, they were in his face and armed to the teeth. Wallace placed his army on a slope, his back to the forest. He'd been fighting in the north of England for months, so his core army was very experienced. But the bulk of his ranks, just ordinary men drawn to Wallace, but basically farmers desperate to free their land. His spearmen, carrying 12-foot spikes, formed shiltrons. These were long ranks that were designed to stop cavalry. Each shiltron with 1,500 men backed up with skilled archers from Ettrick under the command of James the Steward's brother, John Stuart of Jedburgh. The main problem was they had hardly any cavalry. Edward Longshanks had masses of knights and huge squadrons fighting for him as their feudal obligation. Were they to refuse, their lands would be taken. The Scots had no real cavalry, merely a few riders capable of skirmishing. This was the equivalent of Barcelona taking on a pub team. The chances of victory, right from the beginning, almost non-existent. The Scots declared that they loved their country, so would fight to the death to defend it. Wallace knew he was completely outnumbered in everything except raw courage. If only a few of the Scottish aristocrats had a tenth of it, they could have seen off this brutish English king. Just prior to the battle, the Scots were told that the English army had been raping and murdering since they crossed the border, wiping out entire villages as a warning to all Scots not to dare face them. Numerous villages in North Northumberland had been torched too for helping wounded Scots or showing sympathy to their cause. It is said that the English army almost destroyed Morpeth. Edward was not known for his mercy. His torturer, John Sage, once one of his lieutenants, had gained a vicious reputation at Chillingham Castle, where Edward had regularly stayed. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and in such conflicts, suicide is often the chosen fate, rather than submitting to a loathed enemy. It's believed that one of Wallace's women had slit her own wrists rather than be used by the English. Wallace knew that victory was unlikely, but his crazed technique of attacking the hearts of his enemy's ranks had worked so many times before, provided it was done fearlessly. So he organised five shiltrons, all surrounded by dug-in spikes, between each one archers and a small cavalry provided by the one noble brave enough to fight by his side, Sir John Common, known as the Red Common of Badenoch. He was ginger, you see, as the best ones are. A true Scottish ginger with long red hair, quite an imposing figure and brave to the extreme. 
Wallace knew that his men were not stupid and realized the hopelessness of taking on such a gigantic army. But they were Scots and bolstered by pride, anger at the recent rapes and murders and a love of their homeland and a love of the Wallace. They were ready. Wallace stood on a rock and shouted, I have brought you a long way to this ring. Now dance if you can. The English attack was frankly a mess. They ordered the Welsh to make the first wave. However, they were still totally pissed off at the English king because of racism against them, and they refused to advance against any of these formidable shiltrons. One Welsh commander said, You bastards seek our lives just to tire the enemy out, then you'll ride over our bodies and claim glory against the Waleses. Another was believed to say, Wallace is a Wales man. You face him, we'll not. The English cavalry were forced to ride out and found themselves foundering and falling from their horses in the steep slopes between the Shiltrons. Others waded into a marsh, some horses became stuck, whilst the knights were picked off by archers or tried to dismount and sunk into the bog because of the weight of their armour. It was an undignified mess. The second charge was more organised and pounded into the walls of the Shiltron, but it held firm, and numerous English knights and even more horses were impaled, crashing to the ground, or they hung like macabre decorations on the spears, screaming in agony. The Scottish should have let their cavalry distract the knights, who were now roaring into battle. Instead, they rode off without striking a blow. The so-called nobles had no spirit to fight. They would rather vanish back to their castles and estates and pretend that they'd had nothing to do with the battle. Wallace had never truly trusted them and this suspected plot where the English had paid them to pretend to fight to drive fear into the common Scots who watched their retreat in horror. Yet they stood firm. They couldn't break into the squares. The cavalry had been defending the Ettrick archers, who were now totally exposed. Sir John Stuart leapt off his horse to stand with his men as the cavalry rode them down. Within minutes, they were all dead, and Stuart was being dragged around the battlefield by one of the English commanders who was about to deliver some verbal attack when his horse collapsed onto the ground. It had been hit by a spear, and one single Scot was running at him, as he lay on the ground, barely able to raise himself up. The Scot, just an extraordinary, ordinary man, hacked off his head and he picked it up as the Shiltrons cheered. He stood there, waiting to die. To his surprise, nothing happened. So he began walking back to his Shiltron. A glorious moment, but only that. Unable to make any advances against the Shiltrons, Edward called in his secret weapon his own personal Lancashire archers, all equipped with the new longbows that would later destroy the French at Cressy, Poitiers and the famous Agincourt. They had new arrows too, tipped with iron that could penetrate leather and even chain mail at a range of 600 metres. Without any cavalry to disrupt them, they fired wave after wave into the Shiltrons, and after an hour of this relentless assault, so many were killed or wounded, the ranks began to waver. Gaps started to appear, and the archers stopped as the cavalry flooded into the Shiltrons. Eventually, the Scots found themselves trapped by their own square, and they were utterly wiped out. So many were killed that rivers of blood rolled down the hills, gushing over the grass and creating a gory lake at the base that took half a day to sink into the ground. Wallace and a handful of his elite had managed to fight his way from the battlefield, but the Scottish army was no more. They were being slaughtered. Their only hope was to try and flee into the woods where the cavalry couldn't follow them. Only a few succeeded. Others were tracked and put to the sword. Some trees were cut down to reach Scots hiding in the branches. The English victory had been as great as Wallace's at Stirling Bridge. He'd lost his most trusted allies like Sir John Stuart and his best friend and planner Sir John de Graham, a local hero. The area of Falkirk called Grahamstown is dedicated to him. His tomb's in the graveyard of St Morden's Church. His epitaph reads, Here lies Sir John de Graham, baith white, which means brave, and wise, ain of the chiefs who rescued Scotland thrice, and better knight not to the world was lent. No was good Graham of truth and hardiment, meaning boldness. 
To everybody's horror, Robert the Bruce, a Scottish noble, had actually ridden down the Scottish survivors, mercilessly hacking down beaten Scots, his own kind, in a brutal, unforgiving treachery. It seems he believed that if Scots did not fight with him, they had no value, so should be exterminated, a lackey for the English king, and rewarded well for his betrayal. Many historians tell how Bruce caught up with Wallace and arrogantly berated him for daring to attack the English king on whose land, Scotland, he'd been living. Wallace's reply was dignified but unforgiving. Robert, Robert, it is your inactivity and womanish cowardice that spur me to the liberation of the native land that is legally yours. And indeed, it is an effete man even now, ready as he is to advance from bed to battle, from the shadow to the sunlight, with a pampered body accustomed to a soft life, feebly taking up the battle for the liberation of his own country. It is he who made me so presumptuous, perhaps even foolish, and has compelled me to seize these tasks. Then Wallace took flight. Robert the Bruce was so affected by Wallace's words, it woke him from his weird acceptance of all things English. He realized how wrong he had been. The Bruce would never be the same again. Walking in the footsteps of Braveheart. Radio. Alan Robson, walking in the footsteps of the bereaved heart. I was wondering if you could do that when it matters. As it, as it matters in battle. Could you crush a man with that throw? I could crush you like a worm. The present moment we're travelling down to an area of Lanarkshire. Not too far from Falkirk. We're going to be stopping close to a place where Wallace was eventually taken. We've just been hearing about battles and we heard your amazing regression where you are witnessing all of these horrific things. A stupid question, but a question I couldn't ask anybody else. What's it actually like to be in the middle of a battle? When, when you're in the middle of that, all you can hear, it's a massive crescendo of noise. Um, the sort of weapons clashing against each other, obviously sounds of fighting, blood, noise, but there's a big roar as well from the different, you can, obviously the Scottish are roaring and fighting and the noise, and it's just, it's very hard to describe, because when you're there, all you see is blood and carnage, um, but that, at the time I noticed that during the regression, your chest was kind of, <gasps> yeah. you and although you weren't waving your arms around as if you had weapons, you were telling me that you were you are fighting and you are doing battle and there are people coming towards you and the things that you are seeing. You've got this huge noise and hubbub of 
voices and screaming. Your chest was heaving. You must have been petrified. Oh, scared to death of it all because at any one minute it could be your life that's taken. Um, I mean, you're killing other people and fighting for your country, but at any time it could be you who's the next one slain down there. You paid particular attention to an English head that slipped down into the river forth and you were talking about how you could see the horses in the river because they were drowning and obviously some of them were armoured too and they had armoured knights on their back so if they went into that river essentially they were both dead weren't they? Exactly that and, and that is one of the most vivid things in that that I see in the head getting cut off and rolling down the, the embankment and just lying there and horses that were in the river drowned in there and, and more and more than drowning so in the end the river was just as we said awash with blood and you said that there, there were so many bodies in there that they were just kind of piled up. It was almost like the river was full of the dead. It was just full of dead and blood. And as I say, it said the river's room with blood. That's exactly how I saw it. And the weird thing is, as I say, you could look at the nice greenery that you would see and stuff, but all you could see at the bottom of that was blood and rivers just running with it and horses and people in there lying, dying. It was awful. Well, the defeat at Falkirk was hard to take. But it wasn't a humiliation for Wallace. He'd taken on a much greater army and survived. And you know, the Scots loved him all the more for that. The fact that he'd taken on an impossible foe. He'd given them back their pride and raised a popular resistance against the English who'd murdered their people, raped their women, and not only stolen their land, taken their dignity too. Strangely, the defeat created an even greater spirit against their invaders. So humiliated were the nobles that they decided to join the fight. And for six more years, they would be getting stuck in. If you should visit Falkirk, look out for the site of Wallace's Oak. In 1723, it was described as 36 feet around. Sadly, over the years, bit by bit, souvenir hunters have completely destroyed it. In 1790, a piece of it was made into a box at an Edinburgh goldsmith and presented to George Washington, the first official president of the United States. The roots were dug up to make a snuff box for the English king, King George IV, on the occasion of his visit to Edinburgh in 1822. Even long after his death, the English still wanted a piece of him. So Wallace carrying a great weight following the loss of his beloved friends, resigned as guardian of Scotland. He hated the politics, trying to keep arrogant nobles happy. All he wanted was a free Scotland. As long as a Scot ruled the kingdom, he would be happy. Yet all of the other clans bickered amongst themselves. History tells us that he disappeared, yet individual country records show that he and his hard core of his army, those who had survived Falkirk, fought and won many other, albeit smaller, battles. He inflicted whatever damage he could on English garrisons left by King Edward. It's actually quite hard to catalogue his victories whilst trying to ignore the spin that history puts on the heroes like Wallace. But there were quite a few awesome successes. Small in their way, yet they had all of the British Isles talking about Wallace's courage and ingenuity. Wallace once walked out onto the plain in front of Bothwell Castle and showed himself to the English. A group of 30 or so soldiers raced out to capture him, only to be surrounded by his 60 or 70 men who cut them to pieces. One legend says that their heads were all cut off one by one and they walked over to the castle wall and threw them over. An English lady was travelling to join her husband at Stirling Castle when the carriage was stopped by Wallace. He explained that the English had raped their way across Scotland, creating many a bastard son who would near know a Scottish feather. He told her that three important women in his life had been raped and murdered, and asked her why this shouldn't happen to her. She was lost for an answer, and he told her that he would give her to his men along with her 15-year-old daughter. He tore off her gown, and as she wept in blind terror, said, This no true Scot would ever dee, for tis the way of the barbarian, like the English and your man in Stirling Castle. Naked, he put them back into the carriage and sent them safely on their way. Wallace was known for seeking justice against those who treated the Scottish people harshly, 
As Duncan McGregor found out, a turncoat supporter of the English, he'd been given a few of the lands around here to my left hand side. You can actually see the McGregor land. It's off here as not quite as far as the eye can see, but you can see fields that sweep down to farmland. And he owned much of it. And he had to hold on to it with his mercenary English guard that bullied everyone in the area. It's the area close to a small bridge leading to the M8 from the M60. You see a orange bridge that cuts over the road and the McGregor land was there. Just past it, just, we've actually just gone under it, haven't we? Yeah, just went under it there, exactly that bit. When a priest told him that he was cruel and the priest demanded that he stop this behaviour, he had the priest hanged. His best known atrocity was when he wanted a young girl that he'd watched herding goats. His men kidnapped her and took her to his master. She was barely 14, but at that time she was old enough to marry. He raped her, kept her captive for a month, forcing himself on her whenever he wished. The father took a gaggle of farmers to try and rescue her. They were cut down. One night, the 14-year-old returned home and the mother said, how have you got away from the castle? She said only one word. Wallace. McGregor's men were massacred. The brute's head was placed on a spike in front of the church where the priest had died. The remainder of his body was placed in the town centre naked with the genitals cut off. When the head was removed, the penis and testicles were forced into the mouth. They were partly chewed. He'd been made to eat them before being decapitated. Whilst Red Common, Robert the Bruce, Bishop William Lamberton and Sir Ingram of Umfraville all argued about who should be the rightful Scottish leader, Wallace kept well out of it. He believed it should be King John Balliol, the man Edward I had chosen to be the leader. It was a job Wallace never wanted. On one occasion, he travelled to France to try and persuade Philippe the Fair of France to join them and fight England. He was even introduced to Pope Boniface VII, who sent a letter to the English king demanding a return to sovereignty to Scotland. Edward ignored this and declared he would be tougher on the Scots because of the embarrassment caused by William Wallace meeting the Pope. In 1301, John Balliol was released from papal custody and he returned to his estates in Picardy in France. Many of the old English kings were from French stock. Many of the Scots were from French stock too. So for those people who think we've got England for the English or British to the British, we're all a mixture. Now the fact that Balliol had returned really worried Robert the Bruce, for now he was desperate to be king. So once again... Robert the Bruce defected to join the English. If the French were planning on allying themselves to Scotland after the English defeated them at Courtrai in Belgium, that was never on the cards. Edward also threatened to stop the Pope receiving any money from the English Catholics. This made the Pope stop supporting the honest Scots and sent a letter to their bishops ordering them to do whatever Edward I said. The representative of God on earth in the Vatican bought off by the English king. All the while, Longshanks was planning an invasion in 1303 to crush the Scots forever. He'd forgotten that Wallace was now back in Scotland, but not with any sizable army. Yet when the expeditionary force travelled up to Roslyn, he gathered a peasant army and put them to the chase. When Edward arrived, he bypassed Stirling Castle, and using huge pontoon bridges and tall ships, he waded straight into the Scottish Highlands. They tried to avoid major battles that they couldn't win, and Wallace and the rest fought guerrilla skirmishes instead. Finally, Red Common surrendered on behalf of Scotland. Robert the Bruce was there to negotiate for the English king. Edward knew that he couldn't hold Scotland unless the rich nobles swore loyalty, and he offered them mercy and the ability to keep their own land, and they snatched his hand off. They already had a lot of land given to them by Edward in England. At first, mercy was going to cover all of the Scottish rebels. But there was no way Wallace would ever consider such a thing. William Wallace and Sir Simon Fraser were declared outlaws, and Edward refused mercy to Sir John de Soules and Sir Ingram of Umfraville until Wallace was caught. Now, the only place in Scotland that Edward did not control 
was Stirling Castle. So he readied himself for a complete siege. He gathered siege engines and a huge arsenal of crossbows, lead, iron and bolts. This began in 1304 and lasted for three months, led by an incredible machine called Warwolf that battered away at the walls. Lethal earthenware bombs of Greek fire, sulfur and saltpeter blended with charcoal and pitch would rain down on the defenders, setting them aflame. Yet the valiant Scots were never beaten until the food ran out and they were forced to surrender. Its leaders were stripped, humiliated and lashed, but their lives spared. Robert the Bruce had watched the siege and then slipped away to do a deal with Bishop Lamberton to unite the rich Scottish allies. Yet still there was the matter of William Wallace. Edward demanded that Common and Fraser should track down their own friend and that failure to do so would mean their deaths and that of their families. Now you see when somebody says in history, and this is something that I just found out not that long ago, they would be killed and so would their families. You think, well, that means the wife and children. No, they would track down their family, their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, their grandparents, their in-laws, and they would wipe out 70, 80, 90 people claiming their land for the church or claiming the land for England, taking everything that they had. Wallace was the greatest enemy. And this seemed to make the ordinary Scot even keener to protect them. Edward tried to buy off the people, offering the huge reward of a hundred pounds, which would be like ten thousand pounds these days. For the English king, Wallace symbolised the spirit of Scottish resistance. The war with Scotland could only end if the Scots themselves turned in their greatest folk hero. More than ever, William Wallace was alone, and it was only a matter of time before he would be captured and sentenced to death. On saying that, Wallace could have left Scotland and sought refuge in France. He had many opportunities to do that, and the French offered him refuge there. They were even prepared to send a boat over to collect him. He was held in such high esteem. But many believed that his death was becoming necessary. You know, at the very beginning I was saying how some people were born to die and it was just on the cards many believe it was necessary to waken the Scots to allow them to rise again now if you visit Sir Walter Scott's house in Abbotsford you can see a chair made of rafters from a barn in Rob Royston it was in this barn where Wallace was captured on the 3rd of August 1305. On that precise spot, now amid a housing estate on the outskirts of Glasgow, to be honest, you should be seeing it. When you go into Glasgow from this area, to your left-hand side, there's the Garfield housing estate. It's to the left, and there's a huge pink block of flats that you notice before you see anything. We're now driving around, heading back to precisely this area. We're walking in the footsteps of the Braveheart. There to the left-hand side, you can see in the distance, we're not going around there, but on the roundabout, on the A80, on the M80, heading towards Glasgow, there's a tall... Now, that's the Garfield. Now, to your left-hand side now, there's some farm buildings. You also come across behind the farm buildings, there's a huge housing estate. And it was there where Wallace was captured. There's a massive stone monument in the middle of the housing estate showing where that barn once stood. After months of constantly moving with his small band of warriors, living in caves and snatching a very basic survival, it was a fellow Scot who took him. Sir John Monteith was the arch traitor. The man was the uncle of Sir John Stuart, who had died so gallantly at Falkirk and had fought with the Scots at Dunbar, being imprisoned for his trouble. Monteith was one of Wallace's childhood friends. It was one of Monteith's nephews who joined Wallace's band and lured him to Glasgow, where we are literally minutes away. Just starting to spit on with rain here as well. And that kind of adds at this time of night with all of the headlights coming towards you. It just adds to the feeling that 
you're there and this is Scotland Where, what would Scotland be without a drop of rain and to be honest with a kind of weather that we've had which has been a mixture of one minute it's almost equatorial we've had a right strange mixture since we've been here you can hear we're on the main motorway now with more cars passing by in every direction so how much to betray a hero do you think well the nephew had joined him lured him to where we're heading Glasgow with a promise for Wallace to meet Robert the Bruce Wallace was told that the Bruce was ready to rise against the English king and all the nobles were going to be on side and this could have been the last chance for glory Monteith's nephew was paid 40 mercs to give him up with 60 mercs paid to others and when you work out the value of a merc in currency of that time they got about 12 pounds to betray Scotland's greatest hero Wallace was surprised by Monteith's men unwilling to fight he didn't want to fight men that belonged to his own friend he was bundled into a carriage he was shackled and he was carried into England and Carlisle he was put in the hands of Sir John de Seagrave who had been appointed warden of Scotland south of the Forth the Wallace was paraded through numerous English towns on a 17 day trek including Newcastle and Sunderland Durham and Middlesbrough his hands were bound behind him his feet roped beneath his horse's belly so there was no escape people flocked to see this man who had so plagued their lives for years the newspaper of the day the Lanacost Chronicle showed how ecstatic the English were it wrote the vilest doom is fittest for thy crimes justice demands that thou should die three times thou pillager of many a sacred shrine butcher of thousands threefold death be thine so shall the english from thee gain relief scotland be wise and choose a nobler chief in a moment we are going into the room in glasgow where he was held william wallace from the room that he was initially shackled in readiness to be taken it's a room in a very old building that you can see in glasgow old stone pillars that once were probably a sandy colored but now with the old smoke of glasgow from the 40s 50s and 60s has now been blackened there is one room the wallace room we're going to be there hopefully within the next two to three minutes alan robson walking in the footsteps of william wallace wallace's freedom stolen from him shackled broken find out what happens next britain's most listened to thanks to you and proud to be walking in the footsteps of the brave heart
Britain's most listened to, Alan Robson's Night Owls. Bring me Wallace. Alive if possible. Dead. Just good. just stopped we've come up in a lift from the building it's through this door and the lights the lights don't work well that's okay i don't mind the lights not working you come in and it opens out it's been carpeted this it's an old building it used to be owned by the sheriff the magistrate and there's a room in here it's supposed to be at the end of this corridor but it's so dark the light a little bit of moonlight coming through the windows firing shards of light across the old-fashioned wooden furniture the drawers are so old-fashioned they've got pieces of leather instead of handles allowing you to open and close them bless them do you know what they've done they've actually they've put out for me because they knew i was going to be allowed in here they've put a a glass on a coaster and there's a little bottle of Bunna Habhain Single Eile Malt Scotch Whiskey. God bless him for that. That was nice. But, oh, here it is. Here's the door. It's an old-fashioned wooden door with four panels of very, very jet black wood. It's the original door. And in here was the holding cell where they held William Wallace. As you come through it, hang on. Let's secure ourselves like Wallace would have been secured. And here we are. And this is where he was. Can you imagine somebody that was such a great, huge and immense hero that everybody in Scotland pretty much looked up to him? Or if they were one of the, the royal Scots, they'd probably fear him. And yet for him to have a demise like this is a sadness. But as we said, maybe he was always born to die. He was taken from this cell and displayed through the countryside, as we've already discussed. We, he visited most of the places, most of the main places, around the northeast. On reaching London, though, the excitement was so great that his procession was thronged with people. It took two days to get to Westminster Hall. This hall would later be used to sentence Guy Fawkes, and following the Civil War, it would also see King Charles I sentenced to beheading. In the hall, the oldest part of our current Houses of Parliament, there's a plaque that reads, Near this spot at the King's Bench at the south end of the hall took place the trial of Sir William Wallace. Wallace, the Scottish Patriot, on Monday, 23rd of August, 1305. Yet back then, when Wallace entered the hall, it would have been like entering a bear pit, shouting, shrieking, men slapped him across the head, kicked him, tried to trip him, spat at him. The building would be crammed with spectators. At the time he wasn't called a patriot, the English declared him a murderer, an outlaw, a villain, a sinner against God. There was not anything resembling a trail. Instead, they merely listed pages of charges against him. 
No jury, no judge, just immediate conviction and death sentence. Those facing him were all English lords, and one, Mallory, regaled the crowd by saying, William Wallace, a Scot of Scottish birth, was charged with treason, murder, spoliation of property, robbery, arson, sacrilege. The taps just started working. I don't know whether you heard that, but it did, you, started, did you hear that? It just started by itself. Really. It just started by itself. Whoa. Well, I'm in Scotland and we're naming the charges that Wallace had to face in the room where he was held. Whoa. Heavyweight. <sighs> Sacrilege and atrocities with horrible enormities of every kind. He'd driven out... And again. And again... No, there's no way that there's no, there's way, no that way that, can that can happen. There's no way that can happen. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> if if not unsettling. So anyway, it was loads and loads, just sheets of charges. He'd driven out all of the wardens and servants of our Lord King. He had con. Oh no, this that's, is, that's not good. This is too freaky, isn't it? Yeah. This is too freaky. Yeah, we heard went back to I know back. We, yeah, we got <laughs> the spirits are with us tonight. He'd convened Scottish parliaments and tried to persuade Scottish nobles to submit to the lordship of the King of France and to help that king to destroy the realm of England. Now, Wallace was expected to plead on these charges, you know, when you would give mitigating circumstances and that kind of thing. He admitted everything but treason, saying that he'd never sworn loyalty to an English king. One of the arrogant men who'd been put to flight by Wallace had the honour to order the death of Wallace, who was to be hung, drawn and quartered. He said, The said William, for the manifest sedition that he practised against the Lord King himself, be forlorniously contriving and acting with a view to his death and to the abasement and subversion of his crown and royal dignity by bearing a hostile banner against his liege lord in war to the death, shall be drawn from the Palace of Westminster to the Tower of London and from the Tower to Aldgate and so through the midst of the city to the Elms. Now the Elms were at Smith. You know where the Smithfield Market's held now? Big meat market and stuff? Then on the outskirts of the capital, the Scottish hero, William Wallace, was stripped naked, bound to a hurdle face up, and dragged through the filthy and crowded streets tied to the tails of two horses. The strange noise there. <laughs> this journey must have been hideous and made longer than necessary. Just banging, we're getting, a, we're getting a few things in here, it's just pretty cool. He travelled for over four miles so that the entire city of London could see him. Some urinated on him as he was dragged through horse shit, people pelted stones and rotting fruit. Each minute tied to that must have felt like an hour. Such an indignity for such a valiant man. And today, should you visit Smithfield Meat Market, meat market being appropriate there stands another plaque to the immortal memory of Sir William Wallace a Scottish patriot born at Eldersley Renfrewshire circa 1270 AD who from the year 1296 fought dauntlessly in defence of his country's liberty and independence in the face of fearful odds and great hardship, being eventually betrayed and captured, brought to London and put to death near this spot on the 23rd of August 1305. His example, heroism and devotion inspired those who came after him to win victory from defeat, and his memory remains for all time a source of pride, honour and inspiration to his countrymen. Every day, people still place flowers there, out of respect to a true hero. The dark day had arrived, as Wallace was led up onto the gallows of unusual height, so everyone could see his death. It was a long, drawn-out execution, the triple death that local chronicles had demanded. Firstly, for the robberies, murders, felonies and thefts that he'd perpetuated in the realm of England and the land of Scotland, the initial part of his death sentence began. Wallace was hanged by the neck to the very point of strangulation. Just before he could die, he was cut down barely alive and dragged from the gallows. They slapped him 
covered his face with water until he regained consciousness and set on to torture him further. His penis and testicles were cut off and then he was drawn. This means that your stomach is cut open and whilst still alive, intestines pulled out of his belly, including his panting lungs, liver and still beating heart. The intestines were placed on a fire whilst still attached as Wallace screamed. Finally, his innards were sliced off and burnt too. That was officially his second death for the measureless turpitude of his deeds against God and his holy church. Finally, his lifeless corpse was dragged to a block and he was decapitated for being an outlaw, his third and final death. All that needed to be done was the quartering. Wallace was hacked into four parts and the quarters were sent out to be displayed to the people. His head was placed on a spike on London Bridge to be humiliated as a supposed traitor. Quarters were sent to Perth, Stirling, Berwick near the city gate and on a gibbet in Newcastle called Gallowgate, now the car park just behind St James's Park, the home of Newcastle United. The Wallace was dead, quartered, and sent out like lumps of meat to prove to anyone who cared to listen the might of the English army. The bravest of warriors had suffered the very public humiliation of a traitor's death. Yet he never betrayed his land, Scotland. Instead, he fought with every sinew to wrench his homeland from the claws of the invader. King Edward must have looked at Wallace's head on that spike on London Bridge and thought, that's the end of him. He was so wrong. Edward was not just determined to exterminate him, he wanted to wipe out his very existence. Instead, the way he had treated a genuine hero, it was inevitable that Wallace would become a martyr, a veritable clarion call to awaken all of those Scots who in their shame had stood idly by. It's never enough to merely dispatch an enemy, especially when so many loved and admired him. King Edward had to destroy his body, hack it into pieces in an attempt to show that he was not the great hero they had admired. So he desecrated it, believing that most people would then finally understand how powerful the might of England was and the futility of even the bravest man to stand against them. However, rather like Joan of Arc centuries later, they destroyed her fragile little body in fire, dispersed her ashes, and in turn created an icon forevermore. Maybe it is in the savagery of the treatment that helps create a legend. Even in the world of show business we see it. James Dean, dead in that car travelling over 100 miles an hour. Marilyn Monroe found dead naked. John Lennon shot outside his apartment of Princess Diana in the mangled wreck of a car and in turn they become part of our history. Those who die in their beds do not. The main problem was that no matter how much the king declared that Wallace no longer existed, the people of Scotland not only wanted to remember him, they also wanted and maybe needed to revenge him. The English king also asked historians to write Wallace out of the history books, so many of his successes could never be upcast. Yet a hundred years later, the tales of Wallace were finally collected and written down by Scots. Had William Wallace given up the fight, the history of Scotland would have been so different. Robert the Bruce would never have been so ashamed as to defy the English. As it was, he would lead the Scots to the massive victory of Bannockburn, only a few miles up the road from here. I believe the massive pride the Scots have for their land comes directly from William Wallace and those like them. And it's been my honour to walk in his footsteps. The prisoner wishes to say a word.
Wallace died, but how did Kenny die? In a previous life as William McGregor. We have checked this out. Historically, it fits the time following Wallace, when a lot of the Scots who'd fought with the English had returned to Scotland to take up their land, and they were hated by the Scots who had fought for Wallace. And it is such a scenario that led Kenny to his death. You live longer than 21. Live till I'm 27. You live until you're 27. And how do you die? Battle. In battle. Describe what happened on the day that you died. Let's move forward in time to that day. The day that you're dying. You say you've, you died in battle. Who were you fighting with? A different clan. A different clan this time. Now, you're a McGregor. What was the name of the other clan you were fighting? Gorums. Gorum. Gorum. It was Go the Gorums. And you were fighting with... What were you fighting with this other clan for? What had they done or what had you done to them? They sided with the English. Oh, they sided with the English. Couldn't believe it. The Scottish and they sided with... With the English. Right. So, what did you do then? I mean, how did you get into this fight with them? They turned on some of our clan. Our clan, again, fighting English, repelling them. And then you started fighting back the, against the Gorums. Fight our own people, our own Scottish people. Why? Why could they not fight? With our you. country. So, whereabouts are you when you're fighting with the Gorums? Are you... In a town, or are you out in the countryside? Where where are you fighting these people? Fighting them in their own village. In their own village. We attacked their village. It seemed to be, it seemed to be a trap. A trap. So they were waiting for you. So what happens? You're walking in there. I know you feel frightened. Carry on if you can. Take it as far as you can. You're going into the village. What did the village look like? What were the houses like? Stone. Stone houses. Stone built. What did they have on the roofs? Like, like straw. Like, like, like straw. Branch and branches and... Thatch and branches. And you, you go, you're going into this town. Were there many houses there? Seventeen dotted around. Seventeen dotted around. And did you run straight into the middle of the town? We did. And what happened? They weren't in the houses. They weren't in there. No? None of them were there in the village. Right. And once we got inside there, they attacked us from the outside. Right, what were they using? They've been hiding, they've been using, they, they used swords, they had swords, axes, they had, they had shields, some kind of shields we hadn't seen. Right, you think they got them off the English? They are English shields. English shields, and they're attacking you now. <sighs> it's alright. There's, there's one, there's one of our clan got attacked, oh, I tried to save him, but all, all of them, too many. Too many. They swooped down on him. What are you seeing? Oh, you're feeling pain. What happened? What's happened? An axe struck me in the back. An axe has struck you in the back. You're choking. You're choking. <coughs> <coughs> and what's happening now? They've got me. They've got you. What's happening now? What's happening? I'm... Oh, a sword. A sword as well. <coughs> it's all right. It's okay. This is just a memory. Remember, it's just a memory. Oh, my stomach. You don't feel any pain now. The pain's gone. The pain's gone. You've moved on to another life. Everything's calmer now. <laughs> oh. And you've passed over.
as you know, whenever I regress anybody, we always have a debrief where I make sure they're okay and find out just how much they can remember. I did that with Kenny, and I must admit, I found it quite strange to see him half stripped on my return. It's all right. Take a deep breath. Everything's fine. Take a deep breath. Breathe in for three. You're perfectly fine. You're perfectly fine now. Usually what I do at this point is use a sound effect of an, of an axe flying through <laughs> the air. <laughs> Not sure I want to do that at the present moment because you've just been brutally... Yeah, an axe hit you in the back and then they finished you off with yeah, swords. So you'll not believe this, but actually when you went out there, I've just checked my stomach. Because honestly, I, I, I felt there was a hole there. And that, I know that sounds really silly, but I've actually just checked it there. Just, I had to have a quick look because it felt as though... It was so vivid. It was so vivid. When you got that thing in, in your back, you almost doubled up in the chair. Yeah. You felt yeah. everything. It was a, an axe in the back. Uh, I, I could actually feel that sword going in. And... I, and People will probably think you've watched Braveheart too many times. Believe me, that that was vivid. That was real. I could smell, smell What's the grass. Going? I could taste blood. I could taste the blood in my mouth. Oh dear. Um, Do you have any family in Scotland? My dad was Scottish. My dad died, but he's, he is Scottish. He's Scottish. Uh, yeah, my dad's Scottish. Do you have any McGregors in your family? I'm not sure even what clan. I haven't got a clue. Not even sure what clan. Will belong to, but I'll certainly be looking it up now. <laughs> how how amazing was that? Because it started off, and and you you went straight into battle pretty much when you got back to the memory. You were seventeen years of age, and you were involved in battles. You weren't like a, a key fighter because you were just no. a smallish kid doing your best to finish off. It sounded like your job was to finish off anybody that the warriors had actually. That's exactly what it seemed like. Uh, it seemed as if we'd done nothing but fight, hide. Mm. Hide in the hills again, then then have fights again. Uh, that seemed to be what the whole life consisted of, just to try and... And then it seemed if we had a meaning. At first we just f seemed to be fighting clans for the sake of fight land, and, and, and that was it. But then it was a case of defending our country. That's right. exactly what it felt like. Yeah. And these were the English, and they didn't have armour per se, but they had bits of armour on they them, like, like helmets and shields and stuff. Yes, as if they had things, yeah, holding them, like, the, the material together as well. Right, right. Fastening, like a fastening right. kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah, they had sort of kind of metal protection. Right. It was very hard to work out what it was. Um, yeah. Because we would, I mean, peasants, I suppose, peasants fighting and yeah. just trying to defend the land. I had rags, I was wearing rags. But we were very proud, proud of our country, proud of our land, and, and we just had to defend it from this these people in vain. And you, you remembered, again vividly, losing your whole family that were set on fire and your brothers were tortured. Now when they were tortured, you were sobbing your heart out. Oh, awful. Um, vividly, vividly, they were taking pot shots at my brother and not killing them, deliberately not killing them, torturing them. What, firing it off? Firing, legs, yeah, yeah. Firing arrows into his legs, uh, into his arms, but laughing, joking about it, uh, and then when he was just about, just about dead, they set the tree alight. Mm. Uh, strange, so strange. And you wanted to go back and intervene, but you knew you would just Couldn't die. Couldn't do anything, there was so many of them, and I thought, warn the family, but it was too late. Too late. They burnt them. And they burnt your house down. And saw me dad, dad running out the door, saw him, he was my father, running out the door, ablaze, his whole body ablaze. Saw it, and that fueled you because when you when you managed to kill your first English invader, you said it felt strange, but you were glad that you'd done it. it was like reclaiming a life of one yeah, of your family like, again. I suppose an eye for an eye, but it was like a life for a life. Is it to say that's for what you've done to my family? Right, and uh, this seemed to be what you did at least for the next four five years because. When you were 21, you, you took part in this amazing battle around Coldstream, yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. And it'd uh, be interesting because... I've he, known nothing about any battles at Coldstream at all. There, there's quite a few very, very, very famous battles at Coldstream <laughs> with the Scots against the English. And you've not read any history on that? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, you know, well, it's, yeah, I've visited Scotland a couple of times and that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, that's a really famous battle. 
some yeah. really famous battles around Cold battle. Street. Not just around the time of William Wallace, although they are famous battles around that time, but there are a lot of battles with the English around the Scottish border country and Coldstream was English, then it was Scottish, then it was English, then it was Scottish. There was a lot of passing from hand to hand depending on who was in charge at the time. You are fighting in the cold stream. Yeah. Fantastic. That, that was amazing. You could feel the, the water uh, when we when we had wounds, we'd put them in the stream to wash them away, to cleanse them. Yeah. Um, felt all that. Uh, right next to the stream, the smells, everything was Because so the river was running with blood, you mentioned yeah, at, it was one, red, point, and at you, one point. At one point, there was horses in there, there was people in there. Oh, so, and you also oh, said, there's a head. There's a he that's the head. You mentioned. a head. Just, it had chopped off, like, crossways from across the neck. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of shoulder on there. Yeah, and it was just, it was lying there. It was just lying there, head in the side of the bank. Right. Like, in the side of the bank, though, as if it just caught on a branch or, or right. whatever. Yeah. It was just lying there. It's horrible. And that was just in there, in, in my head, and you could see that. And yeah. So we moved you forward just so we could get some shape to your life to say, well, how did you die? How old were you? Did you live to a, a grand old age? Well, it wasn't to be. No. You were 27, but you weren't fighting the English, but you were fighting their friends, the yeah. Gorums. Who Gorums. <laughs> What's a Gorham? I haven't got a clue. Gorham is a traditionally old Scottish name. I would never have a clue about that. Gorham is a Scot. I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> wouldn't have a clue. Well, it was Gorham, and you were fighting them, and you decided you were going to march into their village and wipe them out because they sided with the English. Sided with they? the English, but they trapped you. They were out yeah, their houses. They, they were waiting for you. They weren't there. We ran in the village. Saw it. Ran in the village. Rest of our clan. And I saw a look of puzzlement on everyone's faces. Couldn't believe it. They had done to us what we'd done to the English. Right. That's what happened. Came in. Came in and just, just wiped me out. And absolutely wiped you out. You felt every blow. Just a bit. <laughs> you, you were in pain. I was, I mean, I don't know what it felt like, but it felt as if I could feel that. Axe I could feel back. the axe on my back. I could feel... Because when, so when driven through me. When that thing hit you in the back, mm. you arched in, in your chair and you moved your stomach forward. And then I said, what's happening now? And he said, sword. And, and it, it was almost like they were holding you on this sword. Uh, it felt like one had me from behind, the one had hit me with the axe, then got my throat. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And the other one just plunged the sword in. Right. And to stop me doing anything. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it felt like. So it stopped me defending. And you could see it. Oh, you could see all of this clearly, and you were hanging there. Two people were attacking you, mm. and then you died. Did you feel any relief when you died? When it happened, it was agony at first, and then it just went black. It just right, went dark. That's fine. And as soon as it went dark, you weren't in any pain anymore. No, gone. And you're not in any pain now. Not at all. Okay. But as I say, I just checked my stomach. In case <laughs> <it wasn't. laughs> that's how vivid it was. Unbelievable. Now, now I must say. Over the weeks and months, you've said, Alan, you, I want to be regressed. Alan, I, I want to be regressed. Scary question to ask. Now, are you glad you've you actually experienced that? Because that was, that was a painful experience. It was very painful. I've got to say, before I come in here, as probably most people are, I was very sceptical. Yeah. Really sceptical. And I thought, no, nah, I'll probably <laughs> just sit there and I'll come up with some things, like as if it's an act type of thing. Yeah. Believe me, it's not an act. And I lived that life. I just lived that whole life there. Were you aware that I was still here? Because I was talking to you all the way through. No, not at all. Not right. at all. I wasn't aware. I was just aware of the battles, the green fields, well, There's the too hills. much going on, I think, for you yeah. to be sitting here with a chair. <laughs> wasn't, <laughs> wasn't aware at all. But, I'll, as I say, very sceptical. But no, my God, am I a believer. <laughs> <laughs> Are you glad you did it, though? Oh, fantastic. That, that hurt, man. It hurt, but it was fantastic. It, right. I mean, now I'll re from that I'll research. I would imagine all family my family history. history, see what it was all about, and see if the you know those things did happen. So well, there's no question that there were battles around Coldstream. That's, yeah. that's absolutely happened. But Kenny, what was uh, my name? <coughs> William McGregor. William McGregor. And you were fighting the Gorums eventually. Fantastic.
so what an incredible night. We've walked in the footsteps of the brave heart. We've taken Kenny back to see the places where he fought. How does it feel now that you've done all of that? Absolutely fantastic. And to bring it all to life again, even though I was supposed to experience it and hadn't, but now that I'm here and I've done all that, it just really is incredible. It does bring the whole scenario, the whole thing to life, the whole story. Fantastic. Right. Now, I remember you seeing the film Braveheart after the regression to try and find out what it would have been like. Mm. And there's one speech that you learned. And maybe if you can remember it, it would just be a fitting way to bring to an end from a man who in a previous life fought alongside the Wallace. We've walked in his footsteps. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Patriots of Scotland, starving and outnumbered, charged the fields of Bannockburn. They fought like warrior poets. They fought like Scotsmen. And won their freedom. <laughs> 